All right. Uh, it's 10 o'clock. We've begun streaming and recording, so we can begin. Thank you. Uh, good morning. And welcome to the City Planning Commission in person and remote public meeting. Ryan Singer, the Senior Director of Land Use and Commission Operations will now outline general information about this in-person and remote public hearing and how you may participate. Good morning. Uh, verbal testimony may be provided uh, in person, online, and by calling in on your telephone. If you risk, wish to register to speak, uh, you must do so through the NYC Engage portal. Uh, to access the hearing, please register through the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal. A link to join the hearing is on the landing page after you, re you register. Uh, so don't close that landing page without first clicking on the link. If you're accessing the hearing via phone and wish to speak, you must first register with the dial in participant hotline at the numbers listed on the screen. If one of the numbers is busy, please try another. The meeting ID is 618-237-7396. Press pound to skip the participation ID. The password is the numeral one. The phone number is also posted on the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal. Please note that no matter how you're accessing the meeting, you must register if you want to speak. Those accessing the meeting online will have the option to turn on their camera while giving testimony. When it is your turn to speak, you'll be notified and promoted to a panelist. This will allow you to unmute your microphone and grant you the ability to turn on your camera. Please listen closely for your name to be called. There'll be a short period where it will appear that you're no longer in the meeting. Don't be alarmed. You should rejoin the meeting as a panelist. If you're accessing the hearing via phone, your name will be called from the list of registered speakers. Once your name has been called, you'll be given the ability to unmute yourself. You do this by pressing star six to unmute your phone. For those listening to the hearing through the online live stream, um, but who decide they wish to speak uh, during the hearing, they must first register to speak through the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal it's not possible to testify through the online live stream. For those accessing the hearing via phone who've not yet registered to speak but wish to do so, you also must register first to speak through the dial-in participant hotline that I described a moment ago. Um, speakers are limited to three minutes of testimony. There are a few exceptions to the three minute time limit. Elected officials are accorded the courtesy of jumping to the front of the queue and are not limited to three minutes. If consecutive translation services are being used, the time will be extended to five minutes and an applicant team with three or more speakers may make a team presentation. The team will be allowed a total of 10 minutes. The chair will announce when the time limit is reached. Please be mindful of potential background noise during your testimony. Please make sure that if you're watching the hearings um, be a live stream that the live stream is muted when you begin your testimony. Otherwise, you will hear an echo. If you wish to submit written testimony, it should be submitted to the Department of City Planning. The mailing and email addresses can be found on our website, planning.nyc.gov. Lastly, please note that this public hearing is being recorded. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the City Planning Commission in person and remote public meeting. Mr. Secretary, please begin the meeting. Thank you, Chair Lamont. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, all. This is the City Planning Commission public meeting held in person at 120 Broadway, Lower Concourse, and remotely through the NYC Engage portal. Today is Wednesday, January 19th, 2022. I will now call the roll. Chair Lermont. Here. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Here. Commissioner Bernie. Here. Commissioner Capelli. Here. Commissioner Cerullo. Here. Commissioner Dweck. Here. Commissioner Eady. Here. Commissioner Goodridge. Here. Commissioner Levin. Here. Commissioner Marine. 
Commissioner Marine. Commissioner Marine is absent. Commissioner Ortiz. Here. He's not absent, he's just muted. It's on the screen. The connection, I am here. Noted. Thank you, Commissioner Marine. Thank you, Commissioner. You're welcome. Commissioner Marine is present. Commissioner Rampashad. Here. A quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes of the public meeting of Wednesday, January 5th, 2022. On the minutes, I make motion to approve. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the minutes are approved. Thank you. The next part of the calendar is the report section on page one. Reports. Borough of the Bronx, calendar number one, CD6, C150355 MMX, in a matter of an application for city map amendment concerning East 178th Street demapping. For a favorable report on calendar number one, Chair Lermont. Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Bernie. Yes. Commissioner Capelli. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Goodrich. Abstain. Commissioner Goodrich abstaining. Thank you, Commissioner Goodrich. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Lanine. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rampashad. Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number one. Borough of Queens, calendar number two, CD3, C210189 ZMQ, in a matter of an application for zoning map amendment concerning 99-07 Astoria Boulevard commercial overlay. For a favorable report on calendar number two, Chair Lermont. Oh, yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Bernie. Yes. Commissioner Capelli. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Goodrich. Dane. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Marine. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rampashad. Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number two. Calendar number three, Borough of Queens, number three and four, CD12. Calendar number three, C210213, ZMQ. Calendar number four, N210214, ZRQ. In the matter of application for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning 97-04 Sutphin Boulevard rezoning. For a favorable report on calendar number three and favorable report as modified on calendar number four. Chair Lamont. Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Bernie. Yes. Commissioner Capelli. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Goodrich. Same. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Marine. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rampashad. Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number three, and a favorable report as modified has been adopted on calendar number four. Borough of Queens, calendar number five, CD5, N200270, ZAQ. In the matter of an application for the grant of an authorization concerning 17-18 Decatur Street. For adoption on calendar number five. Chair Lermont. Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Bernie. Yes. Commissioner Capelli. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Goodrich. 
No. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Marine. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rampashad. Yes. Calendar number five has oh. been adopted. Borough of Queens, calendar number six, CD5, N200271 ZAQ. In the matter of an application for the grant of an authorization concerning 11 12 Wyckoff Avenue for adoption on calendar number six, Chair Lamont. Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Bernie. Yes. Commissioner Capelli. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Goodrich. Abstain. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Manin. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rampashad. Yes. Calendar number six has been adopted. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number seven, CD3 N220094 RCR. In a matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning 875 Sinclair Avenue. For adoption on calendar number seven, Chair Lermont. Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Bernie. Yes. Commissioner Capelli. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Goodrich. Same. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Manin. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rampashad. Yes. Calendar number seven has been adopted. Borough of Staten Island, calendar numbers eight and nine, our last voting item for this morning, commissioners. CD2, calendar number eight, N210464, ZAR. Calendar number nine, N210465, ZAR. In a matter of an application for the grant of authorizations concerning 58 Buttonwood Road. For adoption on calendar numbers eight and nine. Chair Lermont. Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Bernie. Yes. Commissioner Capelli. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Goodrich. Same. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Marine. Commissioner Marine. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rampashad. Yes. Calendar numbers eight and nine have been adopted. Thank you, commissioners. The next part of the calendar is the public hearing section on page 12. A first item, Borough of Queens, calendar number 10, CD 12, N. 220-224-BDQ, a public hearing in a matter of an application for an amendment concerning the Sutphin Boulevard bid expansion. Thank you. This will be a 10 minute presentation. But again, we ask others that are testifying to limit their remarks to three minutes after which you would be muted. And please also let me know that while we welcome any uh, your opportunity to speak and make comments. We ask that decorum and courtesy be uh, observed at all times during your testimony. Thank you. You may begin. Do we have Blaze, Roxanne, and Zach in the room? There we go. Okay. 
you should be able to unmute yourself. Okay, all set, I think. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, all right, well, thank you very much, uh, commissioners, Chair Laramont. Uh, it's good to see everyone virtually. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm, I'm Blaze Backer, Deputy Commissioner of Neighborhood Development. I'll be giving a quick overview and rationale. I'll turn it over to Zach Owens, my Senior Policy Advisor, to talk about the community engagement effort, and to Roxanne Early, Director of the Bid Program, to walk you through the proposal. Uh, and then I'll, um, I'll wrap things up at the end. Next slide. Um, I think you're all uh, familiar with what uh, we're talking about in this ULERP number, but of course the action before you all is uh, the extension of the Sutphin Boulevard bid and the renaming of it to the downtown Jamaica bid. And the overall project, of course, involves the merging of um, one bid and two SADs um, and eventually dis dissolving the two existing SADs. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so to the overarching proposal, um, <clears throat> which is helpful to clear, I think, up front, um, is to have a single unified bid with a single combined board of directors um, to have boundaries that will only encompass properties already within one of the three existing bids. And something that I think there was some confusion about to be very clear about it, that no bid is taking over any other bid. This proposal is ultimately a merger of equals and all existing board members and existing staff have equal standing and opportunity to serve. Uh, the elements of the proposed unification draw from board feedback via, via unification committee, uh, discussions and surveys, extensive research conducted by consultants, the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, um, and analysis of the bid's financial records and annual reports. And it's worth noting that there is a precedent um, on a merger and a, and a SAD dissolution in 1998 um, uh, with the dissolution of the Nassau Street SAD into the, uh, merged into the Downtown Alliance. And of course, the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, while not uh, a full formal unification, um, do work together under a management agreement. Next slide. Um, just for location and context, which I think, um, again, you're all familiar with, um, I'll just rush uh, these are the three bids we're talking about. Uh, and again, we say bid um, to kind of represent uh, SAD since we treat them equally uh, within SBS. Um, but 165th and Sutphin having budgets of about 250,000 in Jamaica, a little over $1 million. Uh, next slide. Um, so key goals here really, uh, five top of them to increase the capacity to support downtown Jamaica. Um, we're talking about operational and cost efficiencies increase staff capacity to, to specialize and provide broader and deeper district programs, opportunity for unified branding, a key finding of the Jamaica Now Plan, uh, a unified voice and advocating with uh, city agencies, elected officials in the private sector, and an organization that is uh, generally more representative of the commercial district as a whole uh, by bringing uh, council members onto uh, the board, which SADs do not have, community board as a non-voting member, as well as potentially um, other stakeholders. Next slide. So the challenges facing downtown Jamaica, if you're familiar with it, um, these are been heard talked about commonly on the Jamaica Now and in the Commercial District Needs Assessment, lack of quality retail options and full service options, a lack of a comprehensive and consistent business attraction strategy, inadequate public and a negative perception of safety, a lot of lack of trees, open space and street furniture, deteriorating physical streetscape conditions, you'll hear a lot about brick pavers, um, a lot of blatant disregard for parking restrictions in some of those areas that are designated pedestrian like 165th Mall and no cohesive downtown Jamaica identity. Next slide. So a lot, something that might be lesser known along with the challenges that the neighborhood faces, the three bids themselves have some real structural deficiencies that have made it incredibly difficult for them. And, and I say all these things as, as, a, as someone who obviously comes from the bid world and we work tirelessly to help all of our bids. But some of these bids have some real challenges um, and it's worth, it's worth pointing them out because it's something we have worked with them to correct, um, but ultimately have been not successful. In the case of Sutphin and 165th Street Mall, given their size and the fact that they are few residential properties, um, have actually have not been able to comply with the bid law on, regarding their board makeup for quite uh, several number of years. Um, and, and again, some of this has to do with in 165th, 165th Street's case, uh, because it's one block long, there literally aren't that many properties. Um, and in Sutphin's case, uh, a, a lack of residential properties and just honestly, a lack of um, of, of engagement that's needed to, to, to have a full board. Uh, in Jamaica Center's case, of course, again, the full maintenance and replacement of the brick pavers has created um, a, a situation where they're spending over 20% of their assessment on insurance. 
And ultimately, another of what have helped um, kind of move this forward over the summer, Jamaica Center actually, the board actually voted to proceed with dissolution um, without a change in its financial obligations. Next slide. All right, good morning. Um, so I'm gonna touch on the community engagement. I'm the uh, representative of the three boards uh, um, in downtown Jamaica as a representative of the city. And this is an idea that originated directly from the community. Um, back in 2014, the Queen Borough's president's office, Melinda Katz at the time, um, in conjunction with the mayor's office, launched the Jamaica Planning Initiative. Uh, and there were several stakeholder interviews and nine months of planning and over 30 meetings. Next slide, please. Which ultimately led to the outcome of the Jamaica Now Action Plan, which had these three recommendations um, that you see on the slide here. And to effectuate those three recommendations, uh, they recommended merging the three downtown bids. In 2018, SBS also um, awarded Jamaica Center a grant to conduct a commercial district needs assessment where over 300 merchants uh, and property owners and shoppers were interviewed that uh, reinforced the findings of the Jamaica Now recommendations. Next slide. These are just some key milestones from the uh, past several years as it relates to the unification. So this has been a conversation underway for seven years. Um, when everything kicked off back in 2014 via Jamaica Now, um, once the plan came out, the three bids uh, collectively got together, formed a unification committee. SBS funded a consultant to provide some additional analysis um, and a path forward, and it re ultimately recommended a single bid versus a management entity. Uh, Subfin did approve the merger in 2016, and then downtown um, Jamaica Center uh, approved it in 2021 because of the issues exacerbated by the pandemic. And then the council member asked us to move forward with the, uh, with the recommendation. Next slide. The unification of the three downtown organizations into a single expanded bid will provide a number of benefits. Chief among them is the significant administrative cost savings. Currently, the three bids spend 60% of their combined budgets on administrative costs for a total of $922,173, which is significantly higher than the average across the bid program of 20%. Unification would reduce this burden, freeing up funding to go towards desirable key services like public safety, beautification, and streetscape improvements. Next slide, please. The proposal would combine the three current bid budgets for a proposed year one budget of $1,350,000 with a maximum assessment cap of $1,500,000. This incorporates a 10% efficiency savings. In subsequent years, the board may vote to increase the annual budget up to the assessment cap or to seek to raise that maximum assessment cap with legislative approval from the New York City Council. Next slide, please. The proposed plan would move all three bids to the same formula, a 50% linear frontage and 50% assessed value formula. This formula would consider the size and value of the building in addition to the length of the street frontage and will be more equitable across the district. Next slide, please. And on average, this proposed formula will realize savings for property owners and businesses in all three of the existing districts. The medium assessment in each district will decrease as much as 40%, with the overall maximum, minimum, and average bill decreasing as well. Next slide, please. So, in um, so um, beyond this body, once we go to uh, City Council, uh, the City Council will be considering uh, this, uh, this action as well as the dissolution of the two bids simultaneously. Uh, and should these uh, the bills pass city council and be signed into law, I just wanted to share what would be next steps. Uh, the three district management associations, the nonprofit entities that manage the bids would need to be uh, merged. We need to modify their certificates of incorporation and bylaws would be amended. A single unified interim board of directors would allow all existing board members to serve within the constraints provided by in the bid law, meaning that property owners must remain in the majority um, until elections at the annual meeting. Any existing assets or liabilities that might exist with the, uh, the current DMAs uh, would need to be restricted. Um, a unified board would then do a, a search for an executive director. And our goal uh, would be that the combined budget and services with the new formula would be applied um, by the February, um, I'm sorry, by FY23 billing on July 1st. Next slide. And just to close, um, some clarifications I wanna say up front. 
there had been some um, some misinformation uh, um, at the recent community board meeting, um, as well as um, elsewhere. And I wanted to be very clear that none of the bid boards had opposed this unification. Both Jamaica Center and Sutphin had passed resolutions. 165th has not taken it up due to their uh, their lack of full standing um, of a full seated board. Um, and we believe all the concerns they raised has been addressed. Um, we do think we heard a lot about slow down, slow down. We feel like seven years um, has a long time to talk about this and there was a real urgency to move forward. The brick paver liability is not being absorbed by the Sutfin bid. And um, on the contrary, the goal is to remove it by dissolving the SADs. And finally, in closing, um, you know, we do believe that we as SBS are providing this community and the bid unification will provide the tools needed to, to come up with a more vibrant plan for downtown Jamaica. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much uh, for that team presentation. And I would ask the uh, commission if there are questions, start with Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I think you did a great job sort of laying out, you know, really practical solution to um, a challenge that's been going on for a while. Um, you know, as you noted, the, the community board has indicated that the landscape has changed. Um, um, could you respond to that? I'm sure there's going to be someone from the community board, but I wanted to hear sort of what, what, what about the landscape has changed, and what's sort of SBS's position on that. Um, thanks for the question. Um, I'm not sure exactly what they meant by that, quite frankly. I mean, I think there was a lot of comment about the community board not having felt included in the Jamaican out process. I obviously, I, while I participated myself in that process, I couldn't speak exactly um, to whether that was accurate or not. So I think there was, there was that sense and therefore the fact that that happened a while ago. And then I think there was this sense as, as I think can happen where the community board felt somewhat out of the loop, even though the community board has a non-voting seat on the Sutphin board, the DMAs, um, both 165th and Jamaica Center, don't have the community board sitting there in meetings. So I think they were not perhaps part of this ongoing conversation the last several years. I, I'm not sure why um, the rep who, who joined Sutton board meetings had not sort of brought that back to the board. So in terms of the landscape changing, we feel, if anything, we think the pandemic has actually, yes, has changed it, but in a sense made this more urgent and, and, and sort of the time to move forward. When you look at the numbers that Roxanne presented on, on these are bid reported numbers from FY21, you know, it's, it's, you know, the amount of money not going to sort of direct business services to, um, you know, business attraction to marketing, um, you know, I think it's unfortunate. I think that um, the landscape has sort of provided an opportunity now to actually move forward uh, as quickly as we can. Yeah, Th thank you. And, um, you know, the reduction in assessments, I think, is really meaningful. Um, practically, who sees those savings? Well, I think, as you know, um, it's, you know, SBS is not privy to private leases between a property owner and their tenant. So we don't have actually any data to speak to how many uh, property owners pass the bid assessment on. Um, I think it really does depend on sort of <laughs> nature and sophistication, sophistication of a landlord sometimes and, and sort of, uh, and their leases. So, but I mean, all that being said, I think whether it's a property owner or the commercial tenant, um, we're, I think the likelihood is that those properties that um, perhaps, you know, of a certain width, but that are less lower in value. So perhaps they're not in a prime location, they're less dense, the less square footage, less, uh, you know, they are most likely to see, you know, the bulk of those savings up front. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess, you know, what I find so exciting about this is the opportunity to reduce a financial burden on tenants. And to the extent that uh, property owners are passing those on, and I know that that's um, more more common than than not. Um, you know, I, I think it's meaningful to to point that out. Um, you, you also said um, something I thought was interesting about out of being out of compliance. Um, what happens when a bid is out of compliance? Like, what are the ramifications of failure to comply? Is that dissolution or or you know what is the responsibility um, to comply and what happens if they don't? Yeah, well, there's, I mean, there's, that's a broad term, and there's obviously several ways, uh, arguably, to be out of compliance. There's obviously New York State nonprofit law, there's the bid law, there's the SBS contract. We look at all those things, but what I was speaking to was the governance explicitly, which is in the bid law. 
that speaks to how many you know board members minimum you must have property owners in the majority again the sad is, is slightly different um so in that case you know the reality is the bids have a lot of flexibility i mean if a, you know if someone loses standing in the district or a board member resigns they have the opportunity to have you know, you know, special elections, special appointments, they don't have to wait till an annual meeting. So, you know, there isn't really, I mean, we feel like there's enough room there for, for bids to remain in compliance. What we have done over the last probably four to five years is really work much more closely to help put a spotlight on, the, in a, I would say a good way for our team to help those bids that need more help, right? And no one's trying to kind of uh, embarrass any bids they are our closest partners but what we do try to do is is kind of work with them to feel like what are the problems why are you having a hard time and so when and so quite frankly we have we've had a lot of success um give a lot of credit to i know 165th in particular we worked for many years and and derek was wonderful and really um tackling a couple of things and, and moving the needle so that he wasn't uh, better in compliance but the board issue for him is structural and is very hard to overcome by no fault of its own so i think you know in this case there's a lot of carrots in this work and less sticks. I mean, I don't think anyone is um, attempting or wanting to kind of do anything in an enforcement way if we, we can avoid it. Um, so I don't actually, I, I don't know of any instance where um, SBS, the state, the city has done anything, but I think our, we want to ensure the, the, the bid program as a whole, of course, remains viable, remains a really important tool of the city. In order to do that, the governance is critical and, and that's sort of the, you know, the, the way bids are envisioned and having them be locally controlled and locally governed. You know, we've, we've had boards where it's like the four class D reps or the majority. I mean, it's, and that's not the intent, right? So we do whatever we can to help these bids comply. But at the end of the day, um, we have never taken any major action. I do think it does prevent them from, uh, you know, they obviously adopt budgets for the annual operating, but to take any sort of formal step, changing an assessment formula, uh, expanding any of those things, they're prevented from doing so because we wouldn't enter the legislative process without um, a formal and appropriate board vote. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I did have a question. Uh, this morning, we got a very very thoughtful comment from um, Melva Miller, who supports this and spoke to some of the sort of substantive benefits of merging these in terms of, you know, realizing the goals of uh, continuing revitalization of downtown Jamaica. Can you all just speak to how merging these three would, would accomplish that? Sure. Um, Roxanne, you want to take that? I'm happy to, I feel like I've been talking a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. So one of the things that uh, we heard a lot in, in um, not both the Jamaica Now process, but also the downtown Jamaica commercial district revitalization plan uh, is that there's the need for this unified voice and this unified advocate for the neighborhood and the three organizations merging into one would provide that both uh, budgets for specialized staff who have expertise in those things, uh, as well as program line uh, and budgets in order to expand on some of those programs and services that would help that marketing, advertising, uh, business attention, business attraction uh, and retention, things of that nature that would kind of provide this overall additional programmatic services, but really strategically allowing for a unified voice uh, to advocate on behalf of the district to the city and with other stakeholders. Thank you. Are there any additional questions from the commission? Okay. I don't see any, so thank you very much for your team presentation. Oh, it's Commissioner Goodrich, please, please. I was sort of formulating the question in my head, but I'll, I'll ask it anyone formally. Um, you know what, no, I'll wait, I'm sorry. Sorry. No problem. Okay. Okay. Um, so thank you. The next speaker is Council Member Natasha Williams. Thank you. Good morning. 
Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. My first uh, city morning. planning commission meeting. Um, and so, yes, I'm Natasha Williams, resident of the Southeast Queens area. And actually, before being a council member, I represented the bid associations. And so I know having a unified, unified bid would be extremely impactful to our community. Uh, and incredibly beneficial to all parties. Of course, as you've heard from SBS, uh, there's so many cost efficiencies. Bids would be able to combine their resources and allow for more specialized approaches considering where we are as a city. Um, it'll also reduce a lot of the administrative costs such as rent and insurance. Um, as you all may know, the downtown Jamaica area is uh, developing and thriving and we wanna make sure that we have a contiguous and comprehensive way of promoting the economic opportunities in our communities. It'll also allow the bids to qualify for larger amounts of funding um, and grant bids opportunities to tackle larger projects and systematic issues that have been plaguing um, that area for a long time. And as the former council member kicked off uh, this process, I'm really excited to bring it to the finish line and scale the bid um, and make it much easier uh, for this entity to advocate for the businesses in that area. Um, and, and last but not least, the unification. I knocked my video off, sorry. Oh, I can't turn. Can you guys still hear me? Okay, got it. Um, last but not least, uh, yes. the unification will ensure that all businesses are being adequately represented uh, through the bid. Um, I'm sure, again, as you heard in the presentation, the current authorization of some of the bids don't allow uh, for adequate representation in some of the issues uh, regarding insurance. Um, and yes, I'm feeling in support of the unification process. And I look forward to working with the unified bids. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your testimony, council member, and welcome. Um, hope we see you again. Um, are there any questions from the commission for council, for this council member? Okay, well, thank you again very much for your testimony. Sorry, um, I, I do have a quick question. It looks like uh, speaker. Oh, okay, sure, sure. I'm sorry, I have to get, you, I have to get the hand Please. raising. I was curious, thank you so much. That's very helpful um, uh, to, hear, to, to hear from that perspective. Um, I was curious, uh, what, if anything, are you hearing from your constituents about it? I know we'll hear from the community board, but I was actually curious if any of your constituents, like what are their thoughts about it? Um, or if this is something that is, is not really being talked about. <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, this is, I think this is more of a wonky thing, right? Like people, some people may not even know we have a business improvement. That's what interest, I was thinking. And, right, and they yeah. have no idea what unification means. But I will say the constituents that are familiar and have an understanding of what bids mean for communities in terms of economic development. Um, I have received quite a few people that are in support. Um, as you all know, the community board did not support um, the unification, but I think that is because of um, other factors. Um, some factors of maybe not having enough information in terms of understanding, um, again, what a bid means and all of the positive uh, impacts that a bid, a unified bid can have on the community. So there's some folks who support it. Um, and of course, as you all know, um, there are some few folks um, that did not support the unification of the bids, but I do think um, you know, again, it's a, it's a wonky thing. And so if, and I am privileged because I happen to represent, um, the whole entire bid association. And so as a person from Southeast Queens, when I got, um, into the room with all of the bids and I'm looking at, you know, the downtown Brooklyn bid, I'm looking at the Brooklyn, the, the bid in, in the lower East side, um, the downtown Alliance, I'm like, wow, these, bids that sort of capture a large swath of area actually can have more impact because they are able to have comprehensive conversations about a set part of an area, not just streets, right? Now you just have the Jamaica bid. That's just 
one street. You have 165th Street. That's just one street. You have Stephen Boulevard. That's just one street. But there are things happening in and out of those blocks. And if we can have a more comprehensive approach to ensuring that we are bettering the economic sort of infrastructure of the downtown Jamaica area as we continue to develop, I think that would be a much better approach um, to, again, addressing longstanding issues and also working to be innovative and finding other creative ways to expand uh, the services and the impact in the area. Thank you. That was very helpful. I And it, thank you for clarifying it that way, because I am familiar with, I have wondered why there are alliance bids and then small bids. So that was very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much again, uh, Councilmember Williams. Um, the next speaker is to be uh, Speaker Adrienne Adams. I am not sure if she is in the room. Is she, Ryan? Uh, let us check uh, quickly. She is not in the room. Okay. Wait, I believe, I'm sorry, if I may, I believe that um, her chief of staff, Jamal Wilkerson, might be on the line. I'm not sure if he's still on the line. Um, not... He also does not appear to be in the attendee column. Yeah. We'll keep an eye out for them okay. and have Danielle. Well, clearly, it, whenever she shows up, when she shows up, we'll make her the next speaker. Mm -hmm. That's right. So then we will move on to Justin Rogers. Hello, good morning. Good morning, my name is Justin Rogers. Good morning. And I am the interim president and CEO of Greater Jamaica Development Corporation. GJDC is in full support of the three business improvement districts in downtown Jamaica unifying into one entity. Downtown Jamaica is in the midst of a renaissance, but everyone in the community knows there's still work to be done. This is why I believe a larger better resourced organization that represents the entire downtown is critical to providing improved resources to the community. A single entity would be able to achieve economies of scale with improved infrastructure, technology, and staffing. GJDC currently works with all three biz in the downtown on many different initiatives. It would definitely streamline the process to work with one single organization which would allow GJDC to unify the bid and co-promote businesses and support services to ensure that downtown Jamaica community benefits at most. Now is the time to unify, unify the bids in downtown Jamaica. A single entity would be able to address many community concerns such as quality of life issues, crime, the new Archer and Jamaica busways and attracting smaller mom and pop bars and restaurants into the downtown. I encourage the planning commission to support the unification so that we continue the economic recovery post COVID and work together to make downtown Jamaica one of the top destinations in New York City. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rogers. Um, are there any questions from the commission? Uh, Commissioner Goodrich. Can you talk more about how um, I'm interested in how it would attract more small businesses? I think probably one of the concerns is, is that it would do the opposite, which would attract large businesses that would push out small mom and pop businesses. So I'd love to hear more about it. So, I mean, currently the two of the business, two of the bids downtown are actually one person shops. So Greater Jamaica as an organization, we have taken on the retail attraction initiative in the downtown, I would say for the past 12 to 15 years. Um, initially the goal was to attract national um, retailers to the downtown, but now that we have that, um, the goal is to attract local mom and pops and so they can open up bars and restaurants. Um, Greater Jamaica is also CDFI. 
So we will work with the single entity, which would have more capacity to try to get mom and pops to open, you know, smaller bars and restaurants and stores. And then Greater Jamaica as a CDFI would hopefully be able to provide um, loan assistance um, to do that. Thank you. Um, are there any additional questions for Mr. Rogers? Okay, well, I thank you very much for your testimony. The next speaker is Michael Hirschhorn. We have Mr. Hirschhorn in the room. There we go. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Okay, clearly I'm not Michael Hirschhorn. I am his executive director, Jennifer Furioli, reading his statement on his behalf. Unfortunately, he was traveling today. Uh, Good morning, my name is Michael Hirschhorn and I am a long-standing property owner in the heart of Jamaica Avenue. My building is 16121 Jamaica Avenue, likely recognized by many of you as the corner property, now home to one of downtown Jamaica's few sit-down restaurants, Hook and Reel, a family-friendly establishment. I have served as the president of the board of the Jamaica Center bid for nearly a dozen years. I'm proud of our efforts to remove what is likely over a half million bags of litter from the corridor and thousands of incidents of graffiti during my tenure. Our bid has served as a longstanding advocate for our businesses and as a partner to the city in creating a welcoming commercial corridor. We want to nurture a thriving downtown and by partnering with our peers on Sutphin and 165th Street, I believe that we can. In addition to serving as the president of the Jamaica Center bid, I am a long-standing board member of five additional bids, the 34th Street Partnership in Midtown, 125th Street bid in Harlem, the Hub Third Avenue bid, and the Fordham Road bid, both in the Bronx, and the Fulton Street Mall, which is managed by the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. Given my participation on other bid boards, I know how our organization is severely limited in what it can accomplish due to escalating administrative expenses and how we could all benefit if we operated under a single organization. As my executive director, Jen Ferrioli has put it, we are constantly trying to quell a tsunami of issues with a bare bones staff and a duct tape budget. An alarming portion of our operating budget is allocated to liability insurance alone. In FY22, we expect to pay $222,905 for liability insurance premium and an additional $38,000 in deductibles. For context, the Downtown Alliance in Lower Manhattan, which has a $20 million budget, the largest in the country, only pays $113,000 a year. This issue is unsustainable for Jamaica Center. That is why this past summer, the board approved a resolution to begin the dissolution process if there is no change to the status quo. That means no more sanitation, graffiti removal, marketing or programming on that avenue. Much of the liability cost is related to the decorative pavers that you see on Jamaica Avenue. By unifying under Sutphin's legal structure as proposed today, the liability would be eliminated and the new bid would not have any legal exposure that Jamaica Center is now contending with. Insurance costs for a single bid would be reduced by hundreds of thousands of dollars annually, freeing up money to be spent where it belongs, improving downtown Jamaica. We could save even more money by eventually combining office space and achieving economies of scale and significant contracts, such as sanitation services. Just imagine what we could do to improve downtown Jamaica with those additional savings. I am certain that working alongside our partner property owners oh, and thank small you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brioli. Your time is expired. Thank you. Um, are there questions? Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Levin. 
Um, yes, thank you. I'm not sure if you're the right person to ask. I probably should have asked this question earlier, but can somebody please explain, or I guess you're the only speaker right at the moment. Um, please explain this insurance issue. What happens to the liability? How does the liability uh, associated with the brick pavers just evaporate? Or does it get transferred to the city or someone else? Uh, like everywhere else in this city, this organization has um, shouldered an unfair burden everywhere, or everywhere else in the city. The um, property owners have liability for their, um, the condition of their sidewalks. Um, in this case, they still do have some responsibility and liability. So they're getting pulled into court alongside us. And what frequently happens is we'll have to end up splitting the um, settlements that come in. So it's still hurting the property owners as well. Um, but in addition, they're also not getting the services that they pay for, um, for that supplemental, you know, that, that menu of supplemental services. So if we were to go under because of this issue, they're still going to have sidewalk liability. They're not going to have an organization that can help keep their streets clean and support their small businesses and deal with all of the legal dumping and everything else. Um, and they're going to lose the one advocate, uh, which I have taken on as my personal mission to figure out how to resolve this issue in a cost-effective way for everybody downtown. Yeah, no, I, 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 I appreciate that it's a, it's a thorny and complicated process. Very. But just, so you, so with the specialized pavers come, mm -hmm. I gather, some increased um, issues associated with their use by the public. Um, somebody's going to be, remain liable for um, problems. Is that all now, how is it the bids are, that the unified bid would be insulated from liability? So typically um, what would happen is when uh, the Supfin Boulevard bid expands, um, there would be a new, uh, this all boils back to our operating charter, our district plan, which was formed you know, many, many years ago that um, essentially states that the um, Jamaica Center Improvement Association would carry some responsibility for maintaining those papers. And so that has allowed a window for very savvy attorneys to okay. push that liability onto us. Okay, so that um, the the unified bid would not have that liability. Correct. It that would, would all not. be on the property owners. Mm -hmm. As it is elsewhere, everywhere else in this Okay. Area. Okay, so is that gonna lead to increased insurance costs for the property owners? Have you investigated that at all? Um, I have not investigated specifically whether just as a result of that being removed um, from our organization, if that would roll over to the property owners. Yeah. My understanding is really what drives escalated insurance costs um, is if there has been uh, an incident of loss in that site. But again, um, you know, I feel strongly, my current board feels strongly, and uh, other stakeholders in the community feel strongly that this is the beginning of a new chapter where we are taking concrete steps to actually remove these papers. And so I'm already okay. in investigations about how, how to hire a consultant to figure out what kind of funding okay. we could use to do that. Good. That was going to be my next question. So these mm -hmm. papers seem to be problematic. They're um, on their way out. Is is that they absolutely should be on their way out. They were okay. a great idea in theory, but in practice, especially for a highly tra uh, trafficked urban area where utilities and a variety of other people can come in and dig up at will, mm -hmm. um, it just doesn't work. And it's, yeah. it's a horrible liability for the community. Okay. okay, good. Thank you very much. Not a problem. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner or please. Uh, yes, um, you, you actually said something that I, I found striking that um, if the unification does not move forward, um, the, the downtown Jamaica bid um, has, is moving towards um, disillusion. Is that the case? That's correct. Okay. Um, and, you know, that's not just us being stubborn or anything. It is literally going to be forced. We are at the point there's two issues at hand. One, we are nearly 
uninsurable due to our loss history, which is phenomenal um, from the past 10 years. Um, you know, in the past year, as we were trying to renew our policy, um, my broker gave me a full list of nearly all of the insurance companies that had rejected working with our organization because of this issue. Um, and I, I think, you know, anybody that works with bids would understand as well that we are already notoriously a difficult class to insure. Um, so then you add this other complicated layer to it. It's, we are at the final point there. It's also significantly affected our budget. Um, you know, again, I, I think what was said was 21%, but I actually think once deductibles are flushed out this year, it's going to be over a quarter of our operating budget. It's, you know, a $300 unanticipated expense is stressful for us. And um, we've had to cut back sanitation services. Our, what is our bread and butter because of this issue? Um, Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Thank you, Thank you very much, Ms. Florioli, for uh, that testimony. Um, the next speaker, is Asari Kolka. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to add to this. Um, uh, I'm Sari Kolka, and I wanted just to thank everyone for allowing me to express my support for the consolidation of the three business improvement districts uh, in downtown Jamaica. A little background, um, my husband is Peter. Um, I married into his family, um, you know, 30 years ago, but this family has been deeply connected to the business community for over 50 years. Uh, they began as a small retail business called Kulka's Bakery and over the years grew to become property owners and property managers, serving the community and servicing buildings in the downtown. We have seen the ups and downs of the neighborhood over time, and we've always been involved and engaged to provide a vibrant business community in the bid district. We take great pride in leasing our Jamaica Avenue buildings to diverse and responsible small business tenants, ranging from restaurants to healthcare providers. And we are invested in this community financially, historically, and emotionally. We know from all the years of living, working, and investing in Jamaica, that the commercial corridors of Sutton Boulevard, Jamaica Avenue, and 165th Street are economically, socially, and commercially linked. Recently, we've noticed a decline in the quality of life in the neighborhood. Open drug use, dealing, and needles seem to be originating from the Sutton corridor by the subways, and this activity spills over onto Jamaica Avenue. It makes sense to work together under one singular banner to eradicate some of these problems. We look forward to working with our neighbors and businesses on Sutton Boulevard to do this. This consolidation will mitigate replication of programs and save money and time. Having all individuals work via a singular entity also prevents gaps in information sharing and advocacy. And we are all one business community. The bids share many frustrating problems, but also magnificent opportunities that can be better addressed by one entity. For that reason, we are in support of the unification of the three bids. And just to reiterate, this is something that's been discussed at length in this community for many years, and we believe now is the time for this to finally happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kolka. Are there any questions for Ms. Kolka? Commissioner um, Goodrich. I don't have a... a, a a question for this presenter, but I, I do have a question of whether there is anyone else presenting from the bids directly, or um, are the future presenters going to be from the community? So I have a question about the, I mean, I have a general question, but is there anyone else who's still here who's from the bids? It doesn't look like Anyone else signed up is from the bid. Uh, I'll just, just ask my general. Just I, so I'll just ask my general question because I'm, I'm 
sure someone has an answer. It's a, it's a small question, but there was proposed legislation by I think either a council member or a Senator Den Denique Miller to unify the bids. And it was just last month. Um, was that passed or I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I like a little clarification on how this relates to the proposed legislation yeah. because it, apparently some bids were opposed to it. So I'm confused a little bit. Okay. Actually, interestingly, um, Danique, Danique Miller is to be the next speaker. So you okay. can ask that's that question what, okay. um, after his That's what I wanted to okay. know. Yes. All right. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay. Thank you. So thank you again, Ms. Kolka. Uh, um, the next speaker is Danique Miller. And so I'm going to turn the floor over to Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Madam Chair. I, I trust that everyone could hear me. Uh, it's good to see everyone. Greetings, yeah. uh, Chair and the Commission. I'm Donique Miller, and I'm the past council member for District 27, which includes downtown Jamaica. And I'm here to lend my support in favor of the unifying the three bids in the Jamaica area. Technically, the expansion of the Sufton Boulevard bid, which includes the areas encompassed by the Jamaica Center, 165th Street Mall, and Special Assessments Districts. This proposal is the culmination of eight years of work in partnership between SBS, Jamaica Now, elected officials of the greater Jamaica community, and business and community members. It's also the next step in the renaissance of downtown Jamaica area. We've invested millions of dollars to develop thousands of new units of affordable housing, We've allocated resources that support local uh, institutions such as JPAC, JCAL, York College, uh, Jamaica Hospital. Now we must address the state of the retail offering uh, on this commercial corridor. For decades, Jamaica attracted shoppers from across Brooklyn and Queens, Long Island. People flocked to this destination, Birch, Macy's, uh, and uh, other downtown still retail uh, outlets. Today, the discount shops block sidewalks with merchandise and the sanitation and public safety concerns remain constant. Therefore, it is no surprise that the potential customers opt to spend their money other places outside of the New York City tax base and certainly outside of the Jamaica community. By creating one uniform, stronger, one more efficient Jamaica bid, we'll be able to reduce redundancy and reinvest those savings. This includes expanding staff, service capabilities, such as sanitation, public safety. Additionally, a single bid will have greater leverage as an advocate for local businesses and ability to develop and unify Jamaica branding strategy. Most importantly, it will be better engaged with the community with dedicated seats at the table for community board members and for bid members, bid board members. The status quo clearly is not working for us. The 165th Street and Sufton bids entities have been out of compliance with the bid law for years. And as such, their boards are unable to vote even on this matter before us today. The Jamaica Center entity, by far the largest and most productive of the three, is drowning in and, and under insurance obligations and financial turmoil. I trust that you will all see the importance of, of, of supporting this proposal and also danger of, of inaction. Uh, therefore, I, I thank you all for your time and consideration and I urge you all to vote in favor uh, of, of this uh, proposal this morning. Um, and as a matter of clarification, this is the next step in the process. Before it goes to the city council, we have to uh, go through these steps here and, and hopefully uh, sometime in the next uh, two months, we will have uh, this will go before the council for before the full body for a vote, and that vote will be in favor of the consolidations of the bids. Thank you all for your time. So there is there is a proposed. I'm sorry if I'm being um, obtuse, but there's a proposed law in addition to a proposed project before the commission. There are two separate it's, things, or it's one. This is okay. one. This is one process. Okay, so so there is no because I guess what I'm reading is wrong. So there is no law that 
uh, the council member that you specifically proposed. This is the next step in the law, right? In order for this to happen, we, you know, we have community board, we have the planning board, uh, and then um, if 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 we have the votes, then it will go before the full body of the city okay. council. Thank so you. this is mm -hmm. okay. So then my question is one of the main, well, I don't know if it's the main, but certainly one criticism um, is, and I'm gonna quote here, that it, it, so that the most, I'm quoting, the most they have been able to say is that, one, this is from a news article, is that once they have consolidated the bids, we'll create a committee and the committee will then tell us or hire outside experts who will tell us. Um, and that is from or so of downtown Jamaica area. But I think my question is, um, apparently there is a perception that um, the, the consolidation won't actually have any impact. Can you s speak to how it will? Well, like yeah, yeah. The, the, I'm sorry, just to be clear that there's no plan. Um, can you speak to how there is a plan? So yeah, the, 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 yeah. Right now, obviously, um, with the consolidation, we, we, we're talking about, as we indicated in the testimony, the one unified voice. Which, um, which, what we did not highlight is is really a mission plan for the downtown Jamaica area. What that marketing plan and and in terms of the consolidation of services and resources, um, I, I think that will allow us to see the immediate. Uh, 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 benefit of the consolidation. Um, furthermore, having a, a one unified plan around the downtown area, the marketing, the transportation, uh, the, uh, inter the, the entertainment entities, the uh, educational. Right now, everything is just separate and apart, and there is no specific marketing coming out at all about you know the greater Jamaica area. I think having one unified bid would, would address that because You'd be speaking with one voice, although there are, uh, quite frankly, there's there's been no marketing plan and there's been no uh, you know, execution of any plan uh, thus far. And let me just say that that this bid consolidation conversation happened probably seven, eight years ago with, with the Jamaica Now plan. And so there's been a, a lot of time in between to really change the trajectory to do something different. And, and because that we have remained status quo, that it, it is just completely uh, continuing to diminish um, the value of the downtown Jamaica area. And, and I tell you, quite frankly, if you look at um, the communities that the greater Jamaica communities and the average medium incomes and the disposable incomes and, and what we do with that money, we get in our cars and we go to Green Acres and we go to Roosevelt Field and none of those tax dollars stay in our community, nor is it consistent with the amount of investment that we as a city, we as a community have made in nearly uh, 4,000 new units of affordable and market rate housing in the downtown Jamaica area. And, and right now we have not been able to capture that new audience, nor will we be able to with the current environment that we have there. And so it is, it is not just our hopes, um, it is in the Jamaica Now plan, it is in the actions of, of what we've done as a community over the past few years um, that really will attract uh, the business that is necessary to support uh, the new uh, the, the new housing and the rest of and the arts and the rest of the Jamaica Renaissance that is happening now. So clearly, you know, doing nothing. We know what what the problem with that what the, what status quo is, which which we have seen for the past few years, diminishing of, of services and, and chasing people away. Um, but there will absolutely be a consolidation of services because the, the, the resources will be unified into one group, right? And so we won't be acting independently. We won't be providing public safety and, and, and uh, maintenance and the other things independently. Um, and we will have uh, one marketing plan as, as well. So, um, and, 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 and then the uh, communication and the community engagement, I, I think would, 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 uh, would be greatly enhanced as well. And so those are the things that we don't have now. We don't have full participation as, as we just stated with the uh, uh, 
uh, particularly with the, the 165 and, and, uh, and Sufton bids, they have been out of compliance for a number of years now and uh, don't have the, the necessary quorum to even make the decisions, which, which includes to even vote on this matter here before us today. And so um, this is our opportunity to get better. And, and I think there's a, there's a consensus, certainly amongst uh, my, my contemporaries and those in government and, and others who have been uh, really paying close attention to this for the past eight years. So if that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there other questions uh, for this uh, speaker from the uh, commission? <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you very, very much, Council Member Miller, and thank you again for your service to the city. Um, the next speaker is Sean Anderson. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Uh, commissioners, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, Chair Lermont. I'm Sharon Anderson, Director of Economic Development for the Office of the Queensboro President Donovan Richards. I'm here to provide testimony in support of the unification of the three downtown Jamaica business improvement districts. The borough president is serves as the ex officio uh, member on all 13 business improvement districts in the borough of Queens. As such, he's aware of the challenges these small organizations face to provide resources to the small businesses in their corridors, especially under the challenges of the past two years as a result of COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, as small nonprofit organizations with minimal staffing, it is imperative that they build capacity in order to provide resources to meet the growing needs of the community. Our President Richards supports the consolidation of the 165th Street Mall Association, Jamaica Center Business Improvement District, and Sutphin Boulevard Business Improvement District into one unified downtown Jamaica bid. In recent years, the Borough President's Office supported downtown Jamaica with the Jamaica Now Action Plan that included 26 investment projects to enhance the neighborhood of Jamaica. The executive directors of all three bids played a key role in the planning of this initiative and the execution of these projects, which was led by my office through the Jamaica Now Leadership Council. The unification of the three downtown Jamaica bids mentioned above was a recommendation from that plan, and it remains as the only incomplete project from what is otherwise a fully complete initiative, an almost completed initiative. The other 25 projects were completed at an approximate cost of $156 million investment by the City of New York. The Jamaica Now Action Plan was enhanced by the win of the first ever downtown revitalization initiative of $10 million in 2016. Jamaica has seen significant growth in recent years, benefiting from several new mixed-use developments, such as Archer Green Apartments, Aldous the One and Two, The Crossing, The Three of Light, which includes which include several hundred units of housing, an almost completed co-working space at Moda, improved select bus service, and the list goes on. Uh, Jamaica is part of the JFK Airport Village, and it serves as a gateway to New York City with the Long Island Railroad headquarters and the air train station located at Sutton Boulevard and Archer Avenue station. Unification of the three downtown Jamaica bids will, will provide increased organizational funding. It will allow the organization to reduce redundancy and take a more holistic approach to better serve the business community. A unified build will allow opportunities for a broader marketing and branding strategy to influence growth and to meet the growing number of tourists who visit Queens via our new state-of-the-art JFK International Airport, which is under redevelopment. The unified bid will be better equipped with increased very much. staffing. Anderson. Anderson, your time has expired, but thank you very much for your testimony. Um, are there any questions for Ms. Anderson? Commissioner Rompershaw. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Anderson. I was just wondering if there are any other further comments that you were going to state. Uh, if you could put it you know, briefly, <laughs> if you don't mind. Sure. Um, 
that Burr president is available to, and remains available to support council member Natasha Williams and New York City SBS on this initiative. And that this, the unification of the three bids would serve as an indication of how committed the city leaders are to serving the business community, business community as unification will strengthen this community organization to allow, allow uh, the community to be better served um, in downtown Jamaica. In downtown Jamaica. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you for your testimony. Is there any additional uh, commissioner that wishes to ask this uh, speaker any questions? Okay. Well, we thank you again for your testimony. Thank you. Um, we are getting near the end of speakers on this item. And if you haven't registered to speak, but you've decided during the course of this hearing that you would like to, now is the time to register. Again, you can find instructions on how to register, whether online or via telephone at www.nyc.gov slash NYC Engage. Uh, the next speaker is Bridget Pinnell. Hi. Can you see me? Can hear you. No, we hear you though. Okay. Um, sorry about that. This is, uh, I'm having difficulty with it. Give me one second. I may just have to start speaking and then if I can make it work, um, give me one second. Uh, Okay, it's not working. Okay. So, hi, I'm going to just go ahead and speak, although I can't, I'm not on uh, video. Uh, my name is Bridget Pinnell, and I was the executive director of the Jamaica Center Improvement Association from 2008 through 2010. Without hesitation, I can say that my greatest concern was the district's sidewalk pavers and the association. Ms. Pinnell, we seem to have lost you. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, in 2009, I began raising this issue in earnest with my board, local council members, SBS, EDC, DOT, and the Greater Jamaica Development Corporation. Jamaica Center alone has two miles of pavers that are nearly 50 years old. The growing age of the pavers and the sheer size of the district makes the current framework, framework unsustainable. I know this not only from my time at Jamaica Center, but also having worked at one of the only other SADs in New York City, the Fulton Mall Improvement Association in downtown Brooklyn. I worked at Fulton Mall from 2005 through 2008. It too had sidewalk pavers, and as a SAD, the liability that came with it. The organization had struggled financially due to the exponentially growing maintenance costs, as well as staff time lost to managing trip and fall cases. As a result, Fulton Mall was hampered in its ability to adequately provide the programs and services that were needed by the district. Fulton Mall joined with the MetroTech bid to work together. It was through this partnership that allowed the joint staff to successfully advocate for the funding to replace its sidewalk pavers with concrete. I worked on this project directly and the impact was transformative. Budget-wise, Fulton Mall was much smaller than MetroTech, but with shared overhead costs, a larger team, and larger constituency base, Fulton Mall reaped the benefits. Additionally, working together, we were able to execute new marketing and retail outreach programs. This is why I know this proposal is the right choice for downtown Jamaica. It addresses the two great challenges for the district. It ends a special assessment sidewalk liability that has negatively impacted the community for decades, redirecting this large expense back into programs and services, while also providing economies of scales and greater leverage to secure much needed resources that will directly benefit all three districts.
Ms. Ms. Pinnell, have you completed your testimony? I have. Oh, sorry. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions for Ms. Pinnell? Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Thomas Gretsch. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I appreciate it and welcome to all. Happy New Year. Before I go on, I want to just uh, compliment and thank uh, the new city council member, Natasha Williams, and a special shout out to former council member, Danique Miller, who's been a guiding force in this, as well as Melva Miller and former borough president, Melinda Katz. Unifying the three Jamaica area bids is a time who's come and a concept that we can no longer delay. The, the five key areas of opportunity for the unification benefits are as follows. Cost efficiency. We all know that further resource sharing, reduction in administrative labor and staff specialization would be a great thing. Savings can be reallocated to neighborhood programs. Potential areas for, foster, for cost savings include things like administrative staff time, rent, insurance, professional fees, and et cetera. Number two, large scale capacity. Once these organizations are unified in such a way, the potential for more ambitious projects and external, external funding can be gone after. A unified brand and targeted marketing. Today, I know firsthand as the oldest and largest business association in Queens County who works hand in glove with all the bids, merchant associations in Queens County, that a unified brand and targeted marketing would be a great opportunity. The communities expressed the need for this and maintaining and improving existing bid specific programs are also very important. Additionally, more funds can be spent on marketing services as well as sanitation. Additional specialized staff time can be devoted to marketing events as well. There'll be an opportunity for a single portal, a single source for interest in downtown Jamaica. Thanks to our friend at the Greater Jamaica Development Court, uh, Corp, so ably led by Hope Knight and now interim president, Justin Rogers, Jamaica is now the place to be with thousands of housing projects up and running and being developed in the Jamaica area. Number four, greater public leverage. The unified entity would have greater leverage with government agencies and elected officials. By unifying the three bids, for example, the downtown Brooklyn partnership has secured large scale neighborhood investments. Number five, a forum to holistically support downtown. More downtown stakeholders enabled to provide input on issues that affect downtown as a whole. Those are my remarks in support of this and I yield the balance of my time for any questions from this group. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions for Mr. Gretsch? All right, again, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Samantha Champani. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, of course, I'm not Samantha. My name is Conroy Champagny, husband and business partner of Samantha Champagny, a Jamaica Bid Board member on behalf, on whose behalf I'm gonna be making this statement in support of the three bids consolidating. And I'll read this. My name is Samantha Champagny and I'm a merchant tenant representative on the Jamaica Bid Board of Directors. I operate two Golden Cross restaurants on the Avenue, the first at Parsons and second at 16510 Jamaica Avenue in the Art of Jamaica Bid Center and just a minute's walk from 165th Street Bid Boundaries. Over the years, the Jamaica Center bid has been a resource that helps us navigate doing business in downtown Jamaica. Most recently, they have kept us informed on the slated redevelopment of Parsons Public Space, which is directly adjacent to one of our restaurants, and ways to mitigate construction impacts. But because we serve on the board, the bids board, I'm also, I also understand how limited the organization currently is in terms of its capacity 
mostly due to escalating administrative costs, notably insurance. Our leadership is competent and our board is heavily engaged, but the, but the resultant tight budget allows for very little wiggle room and consumes a lot of the executive director's time to resolve. I'm also aware of the ever escalating quality of life and safety challenges with, the, with which the Jamaica bid, center bid, our neighboring 165th bid and Sudfin Boulevard bid and our business community must contend. As an accountant and an owner of two small storefront businesses that collectively employ several dozen people, it makes perfect business sense to me that these three bids with, sorry, with such similar mission and many of the same subcontractors all located within the same workable area would consolidate into one organization. The, saving, the savings of a combined organization would be significant for programming purposes, but also for the rate payers, including my family who, has, who have the assessment passed down onto us through our lease. It seemed to be a case where nearly everybody would benefit. I'm hopeful that this initiative will be successful, as I believe our community will greatly impact, be impacted from the benefits and the end result. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Champagny, on behalf of your wife. Uh, are there questions from the commission for the speaker? Again, thank you. The next speaker is Laurel Brown. There we go. Okay. I have to start my video as well. So hello, everyone. Um, my name is Laurel Brown. Um, I was, my connection to Jamaica, I'm, I'm here to testify in favor of the proposal to expand the Sutton bid. Uh, I was previously the director of operations of the Jamaica Center bid for a year and so, after which I served as the executive director of the Jamaica Center bid. After which I served as the executive vice president of the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, which has been discussed during this hearing. Um, is a model of a unified management structure of multiple bids. But then because I love Jamaica so much, I came back after um, and served as the chief operating officer of the Greater Jamaica Development Corporation. I now do uh, uh, community economic development uh, internationally at a big tech firm, but I'm here um, just to talk about my experience a little bit, um, just so you can understand. I think I have a very unique perspective on this. One, because I sat as a sole executive director with big ambitions and big visions for the district that I was in, but not the resources to match it. And then I sat in a conglomerate entity, with the same big ambitions and the same uh, vision, but then I had the resources to match it. And not only that, uh, when I went to the downtown Brooklyn partnership, we still had, I think Bridget talked about kind of the consolidation of, of the downtown Brooklyn partnership and the three bids, but there were still vestiges of three separate bids when I took over management of the downtown Brooklyn partnership. And I actually worked to operationalize consolidating the management and operations of those three bids. So I can tell you when I first went to downtown Brooklyn partnership, we still had three separate sanitation contracts that we were managing. And I worked to consolidate those under one um, structure. Similarly, we still had three separate security programs that we were operating and I worked to consolidate those under one structure. So I can tell you having seen this and operationalized it, you get more bang for the buck. You get power behind your vision. All the visions that um, council, council member Miller talked about that came out of that Jamaica Now action plan, even out of the 2007 rezoning of downtown Jamaica. The idea was to dream big for Jamaica and that gets operationalized under um, a consolidated structure. I recall when I was actually the direct executive director at the Jamaica Center bid, 
we were trying to operate like the big guys, like the, the bids in Manhattan and or the bids, you know, in Brooklyn, uh, but we just didn't have the budget to match. And so what I was able to do, you know, we wanted to retail attraction and things, didn't have the budget. I ended up partnering with the executive directors at the time that were still in the neighboring bid, Sutphin, and we operated in a quasi unified structure. We entered into one uh uh, consolidated sanitation contract that freed up funds for us to do larger programming such as retail attraction that we would never been able to do and be competitive with some of the large with some of the similar size downtown districts um, in neighborhoods. Ms. Brown, your time has expired, but but I will ask you to just wrap up and uh, finalize your comments to us. Yeah. So the bottom line is, I'm in favor of. This Feel free. To but Sorry, bottom line is I am absolutely having no skin in this game at all, other than a love for downtown Jamaica and sat in this in all kind of the relevant seats and seen how this is done. There was never one day when I was in Brooklyn after we were transitioning from this three three party structure to the uh, to this consolidated structure that somebody came to me and said, hey, I noticed now that, you know, somebody from the outside that was walking downtown Brooklyn never came to me and say, hey, I noticed now that you have a different management structure. It was the same organization. We were just able to do more. And the question about how that gets done doesn't change the vision. It's a matter, this is about how do you operationalize that vision, um, the vision that, that everyone else has been talking about. And I think the consolidated model is the best way to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Ms. Brown from the commission? Commissioner Goodrich. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, is Sutphin Avenue Boulevard like the, uh, the smallest bid out of the three? I wanna see, my understanding is that 165th has uh, less blocks that are under management, but I will defer to somebody else. Uh, I was, I oversaw to make a center bid, so I'm more familiar with that. But. Um, and my last question, you've provided such powerful testimony. Um, we heard testimony before, like provided a visual of, you know, like what the impact of the unification would have. And at least what I heard was um, the term I heard was like less open drug use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm really, I would really, it would really be helpful if you provided a visual, your vision of how you think um, the difference would be. Obviously the council member Miller was very clear about, you know, things have been the same for a long time and it hasn't changed. Um, and it, ha well, it hasn't worked. And so this would be the change. I would, I think it would be really helpful if you provided an actual visual of what, you know, what, what the neighborhood would be with the unification, the impact. And, and it's a great question. And, and what I wanna say is that this, I don't think the vision changes. I think everyone has the same visions, even with the, th the current model, people have the same visions. And I think I, I defer to the boards and the, the businesses and the residents to really help shape that out. But the question is how, whatever that vision may be, what's the best way to effectuate it? And what I saw, we literally just had more funds to pour in to doing the substantive work in downtown Brooklyn. You know, again, so when I was in downtown Brooklyn, um, and, and even when I was in downtown Jamaica, um, before, so in downtown Jamaica, before we unified our sanitation contracts, so we literally worked with the same party, put out a joint RFP, um, and so we're able to get economies of scale within the downtown Jamaica model, within, within when I was running the downtown Jamaica bid. Before that, I could not afford to do retail attraction. So I could not afford to, I, I literally, because I spent most, most of my time doing brick papers and what have you. We were able to get economies of scale so that we were able to do a joint operation, sanitation operation. And then I was able to do a whole nother program, myself and uh, my colleague, uh, Simone Price, who was running the uh, Sutton Boulevard bid at this 
on. And so we used kind of similar marketing materials to do retail attraction. We held a big event, it was in the papers, um, got a hundred brokers to come out. That would not have happened had we not laid that foundation by doing a consolidated effort with our sanitation contracts and freeing up those resources. And it's similar to what I saw in, in downtown Brooklyn as well. It was just, I, it, it was a lot to have three different entities that weren't necessarily coordinated. It, it just, whatever vision that people folks set, it is a lot easier to get it done when you have more folks at the table and you have that level of advocacy to make it happen. But I, I will say, I mean, again, I think there was a 2007 Thank rezoning you. and that 2007 rezoning of downtown Jamaica, imagine more density, imagine a place where you have this really robust mixed use economy. Um, and that's the potential to kind of realize a lot of these plans and visions that the community has collaboratively, collaboratively come to the fore to set. And this is a mechanism to do that because you free up a lot of those resources to invest in substantive work. Thank you. Are, are there any additional questions for Ms. Brown? Okay. Thank you again for your testimony. Um, is there anyone else present who would like to speak on this item? There are no further speakers signed up, nor indicated that they're wanting to speak. Okay. Do we do we have okay. anything at all from Thank the you. It, then this hearing. Oh. Do do we have anything at all from the community okay. board? Anything even in writing? I might have this, but I believe there was a recommendation. We can follow up at um, a review session. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this hearing is closed. Our next item, commissioners, Borough Brooklyn, calendar number 11, CD6, N220160 PXQ, a public hearing and a matter of a notice of intent to acquire office space concerning 97-77 Queens Boulevard DPR office space. Thank you. This will be a three minute uh, team presentation. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, Chair Lerman and Vice Chair Knuckles. My name is Parmat Tripathi. I'm the uh, Chief of Management Services and Agency Chief Contracting Officer at New York City Parks and Recreation. And I'm presenting on the uh, project at 97-77 Queens Boulevard, DPR Office Space Acquisition. Next slide, please. And, and this project is jointly being done by DCAS, Department of Administrative uh, Services and Parks. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the overview, parks would like 30,000 square feet of office space at this location in order to consolidate our Central Forestry, Horticulture and Natural Resources divisions. Currently, these, this, these, this division is spread out amongst three sites, two in uh, trailers, which is not really adequate office space, and one at, in Manhattan, an office building, which is severely overcrowded. Uh, FS, FHNR mission is to protect, restore, and manage the New York City natural spaces, green infrastructure, and take care of the urban ecosystem. Uh, this, the approximately 180 staff will be moving into this no lo new location, which will provide a more efficient office space and, e and efficient operations. Next slide, please. This gives you an aerial map of the project site. Next slide, please. Uh, this proposed site best meets park's needs, specifically it's centrally located in New York City, meaning in Queens. So it's it's close to the other boroughs. It, they, you know, and it and the, the division which oversees all the trees and urban uh, ecosystems, it will allow staff to kind of centrally coordinate with the other boroughs and travel time, and also be close to our capital projects division in Flushing Meadow Corona Park. The site is also very close to uh, 
three three subway lines, MNR and and the uh, I think it's the uh, E line also the train and the and also numerous bus services take you to this location. And there's also a bike lane in Queens Boulevard, which will allow you know employees that want to bike to work. The roadway the road is excellent for services in terms of highways to get us across other boroughs and you know into other locations. And it's LIE is right close by, the Grand Central is close by and the Van Oak Expressway, Expressway also. And in terms of amenities at this site, this site does provide 46 gar garage parking spots for our agency vehicles, which are a combination of fleet and uh, gas and electric vehicles. And in addition, there will be a bike rack for around 24 bicycles. Next slide, please. This gives you the fourth floor space. Next slide, please. And this is the uh, fifth floor layout. Next slide, please. And this just gives you where the current location is marked in red are and where the new proposed site will be. Thank you, commissioners, and open to any questions. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions from the commission? Okay, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, Madam, um, Chair. Madam, Ch Madam Chair, I have a- Oh, Commissioner uh, Ron Prashad, sorry. Yes, uh, uh, thank you for sorry, the presentation. Please. That's okay, and just a couple of quick questions. With this new space that you would be occupying, would there be room to add more in case the parks decides to increase their staff? I'm going to defer that to uh, DCAS. Okay, and one other question I believe uh, uh, Vice Chair Knuckles had asked. Do you know, know the terms of the uh, lease agreement? For this I, I can answer those questions. I, good morning, Kensal. Um, I'm Christine Stoddard with DCAS. Um, to your first question, uh, the floors that we are occupying um, you know, the fifth floor, we have the entire to fourth floor partial is shared with NYU Medical. Um, at this time, there's no further vacant space in the building. But to, to um, combine that with your second question, the term of the lease is 21 years from substantial completion. Uh, both the agency and the landlord wanted the longest term possible. There's also two 10 year renewal options um, that can be exercised. So considering we have such a very long term, um, we can certainly address with the landlord, you know, at some point in the future, if there are going to be other tenants in the building moving out, uh, if we could have an option for expansion, I'm sure the landlord would not take issue with that. And in terms of uh, with that, um, would you be adding more additional cars to the fleet for parking? Do you anticipate that? If there was 46 spots, space, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if there was expansion space, I would imagine they would need additional cars. I think at this time, the parking that we have is adequate for the size of the okay. operation. Okay, good. Thank you. Are there any additional questions for this team? Thank you. Um, is there anyone else present who would like to speak on this item? There are no additional speakers signed up at this point. If so, please let us know. There do not appear to be any further speakers on this item in the room or signed okay. up. Okay, well, thank you very much then. This hearing is closed. Thank you. Our next item, commissioners, Borough of Queens, Calendar numbers 12 and 13, CD6, calendar number 12, C210161, ZMQ. Calendar number 13, N210162, ZRQ. A public hearing in the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning 98-81 Queens Boulevard rezoning. Thank you. This will be a 10 minute team presentation. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. 
Good morning. My name is Eric Palatnik. I believe that is, is an administrative aside. I believe that there's a, a councilwoman is on the phone and has made arrangements to present before me. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Eric. All right. So. Oh, council member Shulman. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much. Um, to uh, Madam Chair and the rest of the City Planning Commission. This is the first time that I'm testifying ever at the City Planning Commission, and I'm glad to be doing it in my new function as the City Council Member for District 29. Uh, after extensive negotiations and discussions, I'm happy to announce that the developer, Trilon LLC, is ready to commit to a project with deeply affordable housing that will allow more families to be able to live in the Forest Hills community. Trilon LLC has agreed to develop under mandatory inclusionary housing, affordable option one, which will require that 25% of the residential floor area of the project be affordable to families who are in an average of 60% of the area median income. To further promote a wider range of affordability, Trilon LLC has also agreed to set aside units compromising approximately 11% of the residential floor area to families who earn 40% of AMI, 7% for families at 60% of AMI, and 7% for families at 100% of AMI. With this revised commitment, the project will bring approximately 40 affordable housing units to Forest Hills, with the majority of these units targeted for households making between $30,000 and $70,000. According to HPD's Housing New York op Open Data, only one new construction affordable housing project was located in Queens Community Board 6 during the entire eight years of the de Blasio administration. I ran for city council as a proponent of affordable housing and community involvement in the development of our neighborhoods. And the outcome for this proposed project is the first example of that commitment. There were other conditions that were expressed by the community board, which we are still exploring with Trilon LLC, but the housing agreement is the most significant. I want to thank you to Queen. I want to thank Queens Community Board Six and Borough President Donovan Richards for their guidance and input into this process. And I also want to thank Trilon LLC for their understanding and continued commitment to our community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Council Member. And I hope that this is not the last time that we see you here. Um, and I very much appreciate appreciate the changes that have been uh, made in this project. So we welcome that. Are there any questions from the commission for council member Shulman? Okay, then we will now, thank you again, move to the team presentation on this project. That's great. Hi, thank you. It's Eric Palatnik. I'm proud that, uh, that the councilwoman was able to make that statement. And I believe that was your main uh, discussion point at your review session the other day. I'd like now to take a few minutes to walk you through the application in its entirety. Uh, also on the phone with us to answer questions and really the main uh, discussion point I mean, will, I think will be with, uh, the uh, MIH component and Alvin's shine of Sidon and shine is on the line with us to talk about that. And I'm, also- I'm on the video, uh, Eric, I'm right here. Great. So. Uh, and I'll go through a quick presentation and also Luigi Russo is on the phone with us. He's the architect from Slice, uh, as well as Michael Abramov, who's the developer. But I'll, I'll, I'll move rather quickly in my presentation I'll, and then I'll build up to, to uh, Alvin and I'll let him make his points. I will try and address some of the points some of the commissioners raised. Uh, the site is laid out right here in front of you. Uh, it's on Queens Boulevard. It's a very prominent site. It's known as the Tower Diner site. It's been there for many years. It's also had the uh, the Trilon Theater there, uh, which has since uh, gone and is no longer there. Uh, although the, the, the remaining marquee is still there. Uh, it is at 9881 Queens Boulevard. And you can see it there bound by 66th Avenue and 99th Street. 66th Avenue is in the back. 99th is on the right. Uh, if the application is approved, we are asking for permission to construct an R8X C24 compliance building. Uh, the building itself uh, right now is zoned R71, the property. 
Uh, if it was allowed to be built, it would be a 15-story building. And I'll let Alvin go through the number of affordable units, but it comes to a 7.16 floor area ratio and about 136,000 square feet of residential and ground floor, as well as 45 parking spaces at the second floor. Next slide, please. I gave you a lot of information, so I'm going to move through. It's in former, of course, former Councilman Cameron Koswitz's district. We we worked, we'd be remiss if we didn't say that was working very closely on things uh, before the, the Councilwoman uh, Shulman came in, as well as Community Board 6, uh, which we, we rest in, in the Community Board of. Next slide, please. The community board vote on this, by the way, was very close. It was about a 50-50 vote. I think with the deciding factor being the fact that we were uh, not providing 60% AMI, but we were at 80%. Next slide, please. This gives you an idea for the site. It's got some larger buildings resting around us. And I think this slide shows you quite clearly. And those of you who know Queens Boulevard know that it is a calls for tall buildings on it. This building is 15 stories. Uh, I'll note the R71, would, uh, we penciled it out would allow for a 17 story building. So the existing zoning actually would allow a 16 story building, excuse me. So the existing zoning actually allows for a taller building than what we're asking for here. Uh, next slide, please. This shows you the context in greater detail. I should also step aside and call out the fact the project is supported and we have an agreement in place with local 32 BJ as the building services. Uh, we are also working with the Fifth Avenue Committee as the not-for-profit administrator. Uh, so I should call that to your attention as well. Uh, next slide, please. You can see the context in the neighborhood. Austin, you can click through the, remain, the next few slides, please. You get the gist. It's got tall buildings. Keep clicking. The next slides all pertain to tall buildings. I'll freeze there for a second. The Tower on Diner, excuse me, the Tower Diner has been an iconic discussion in the community. Uh, it's basically rotting away. It's been a discussion point of being landmarks for many years. That concept was rejected by landmarks themselves. The structure is, is standing there by a whim. Uh, in any event, the owner has agreed to redesign the building in that spirit. And that is what you're seeing here with the design. That's why we're calling that to your attention. Uh, next slide. We've also been working next slide. Uh, this slide, the last pause there. The last slide I was showing you moving fast was to simply give you a depiction or an understanding of uh, of the fact that, well, I lost my place. I'm sorry, the slides moved so fast, I apologize. Uh, now I'm just giving you an idea of the community and if you can click ahead, please. We'll keep going ahead through the photographs. I think everybody understands the neighborhood fairly well. Now we're showing you the rezoning. This is the proposal. Next slide, please. This is the zoning that we're asking you to zone. The left side is from R71. Right side is R8X. Next slide, please. Alvin, why don't you step in at this point? Uh, this slide is irrelevant at this point. Alvin Shine is on the phone, and he can make a few minute presentation to you. Sure. Um, current affordability. Right. You're looking at right now is what was previously proposed. Right. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, so the developer has agreed to modify the proposal to apply under MIH option one, which would provide for the affordable units to be average, to be affordable at an average of 60% of AMI. Um, however, in order to make it more affordable, there will be a range of AMIs available for the affordable units. There'll be actually three income ranges at 40% AMI, 60% AMI, and 100% AMI. That way, people of varying incomes will be able to qualify for the affordable units. Um, I also wanna point out that in response to the community's request, this project will not have any studio units. The request of the community was to have larger uh, bedroom apartments and the developer is complying with that. Instead of the usual mix of studios, one bedroom and two bedroom apartments, this project will have a mix of one bedroom, two bedroom and three bedroom units, which is very unusual. Um, of the 144 units planned, 36 will be under mandatory inclusionary housing, um, of which the majority will be actually at 40% AMI. So that 16 of those, that the 36, uh, that's not the majority, but the majority of the three ranges would be at 40% AMI. At 
2021 AMI schedules, which are subject to change in 2022, a one bedroom apartment would rent at 40% of AMI at $823 a month. A two bedroom would rent at $981 a month and a three bedroom would rent at $1,126 a month, which I think everyone would agree is very affordable. Then in the 60% range, there would be 10 units available, which would include one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom units as well. The one bedroom units would rent at $1,270 a month. The two bedrooms would rent at $1,518 per month. And the three bedroom apartments would rent at $1,746 a month. There will also be some 100% AMI affordable units available. And in that case, the one bedrooms would rent at $2,166 a month. The two bedrooms would rent at $2,592 a month. And the three bedrooms would rent at $2,987 per month. Um, so overall, the developer has done its best to uh, comply with the request of the community board, the, the borough president, and the council person. And um, we think this will be a great project for the area. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. It's Eric Palatnik again. And the reason we don't have a slide is this all just came to fruition uh, within the last 24 to 48 hours. So we will we'll get updated uh, written materials. If we can click forward now, maybe right to the plans, which right there. Uh, Luigi Russo should be on the phone. Luigi, are you on with us? He's the architect. He should be on with us. So I apologize if he's not able to connect for some reason. The building is depicted. Uh, I here. am. I'm sorry. Good morning, everyone. Oh, that's okay. So I wanted to introduce you, Luigi. And Luigi is the, is the man who designed the building. It was Slice Architecture. And uh, I'm going to walk through the, 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 the basics of it. Why don't you, Luigi, why don't you take it from here and walk through the next few pages with everybody? Okay, sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, this is a uh, very important job for us, as you can see. And uh, we've been designing this for the last couple of uh, years. Um, as you can see, this is a rendering looking down uh, Queens Boulevard, which basically, again, the first floor is purely retail. There's a second floor parking and the residential begins on three to 15. Uh, you can go through the next slide, please. This is a view along uh, 99th Street. Uh, and in this specific, uh, again, the, the main entrance to the building has been pushed around uh, from 99th Street to 66th Avenue, and this doesn't really uh, show that entrance. This shows the old entrance, but this is, again, a view down uh, 99th Street. Please, next. This is uh, the residential entrance off of 66th Avenue. Next. This is an overall seller plan, which basically is commercial, purely commercial. Next slide, please. This is the, the revised plan, which shows the uh, residential entrance off of 66th Avenue and the garage and loading off of 99th Street. Next. Typical parking space for the entire second floor, which is access, uh, uh, access through a ramp, which comes off of 99th Street. This is uh, uh, parking, not attended parking, but self-parking for 45 cars. Next. Again, these are very generic uh, elevations. Uh, this is the south elevation. Next. And it just goes around the building. This is 66. Next. Thank you. I'm okay. Uh, your time is uh, expired. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, so now I'm going to ask for questions from the commission. Uh, Commissioner Bernie. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks for the presentation. Could you just finish going through the drawings that you were showing us so that we can see the rest of them, please? I think there's just two more elevations. I don't have control, so. Okay. Be helpful hey. just to see them. Yeah. There we yeah. go. Okay. Is that that's the last drawing? I believe there should be one more. It could be the last. The last. Okay, and, and do those drawings reflect the accurate location of the entrance or, or not? Uh, they do, yes. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Levin? 
Uh, yes, thank you. Just um, for clarification, Mr. Plotnick, I believe you said that in your testimony that the community board vote was split 50-50. In fact, the form that they sent us um, reflects a vote of 32 opposed and um, four in favor. So that's a little bit different than what you represented. Obviously, the main issue is the affordable housing commitment, which I think we've had good, clear testimony about. And it's great that you have um, been flexible on that point at this stage in the game. Um, so that's terrific. I'm looking at the community board's conditions. They've they voted to disapprove this project um, subject to a number of conditions. One of the most important of which is the affordability, but the other has to do with two architectural features um, or building design features that I wonder if you could comment on. Um, they want the architectural elements of both the Trilon and the tower diner marquee and facade inc included into the um, building design. And they want you to pursue environmentally friendly green building certifications such as lead gold um, or platinum. Could uh, the architect maybe comment on those or the development team? Yeah, I, it's Eric Palatnik. I can comment on a couple of things and I'll, the architect can. And I wanna correct my statement and thank you. You're always very astute listener. What I meant to communicate at the community board was that the land use committee was a very okay. close. All right, that's a different and, thing. Yeah, I apologize. It wasn't specific. Uh, I, might, I was speaking a little too fast, but the point was that it was, and it was split basically on the uh, affordability issue. The full board was majority against, obviously, but then the borough president echoed the, the affordability issue, but it became the affordability. Uh, we had a great relationship with the community board. I think we had a very good amicable discussion points for about the two or three years. We went through the process. We went with them numerous times. The list of conditions you see are not uh, forcefully imposed upon us, but were agreed to through a three-year process of, of communication and discussion points. Uh, the design of the building, I think I called out the feature of the Trilon uh, clock tower, the clock tower at the corner, and I'll let Luigi go through that in a second. With respect to the marquee itself, uh, we did start to discuss with the community board maybe moving the residential entrance around onto Queens Boulevard and keeping the marquee and maybe using it in some way there. And we told the community board every discussion we had, and you could you know, obviously you know, double check us here, finished with, they can reach out to us anytime and we will work with them. There was also the request to keep some nostalgia in the building in the form of uh, maybe some photographs of the building on the walls or uh, artifacts that, we, that may be found and things of that nature. And we're doing that. Uh, we've also been asked by the community board to uh, make sure that the bike lane is not blocked during any construction. And we've agreed to that. They've also asked us to conduct an independent traffic study with them of the surrounding blocks for ongoing traffic concerns that predate us and will, of course, our lives will be included in what occurs on those intersections all around us. So we agreed to help them uh, with consultants as needed to communicate with the Department of Transportation on any endeavors they are undertaking. Uh, so uh, we, we have really tried hard to create a very uh, congenial and uh, amicable and, and working together relationship that they okay, should be what about to... What about sustainable building design? Oh, that's I think it's part. critically important in this day and age that where we're be, so yeah. aware of the importance of yeah. um, taking good care of uh, our environment and avoiding um, climate impacts so that it's, uh, I would like to hear how this building is gonna last into the future without burdening the environment. Can you answer that? Um, Mr. Russo, you should be able to speak. Eric, you broke up. I didn't hear what you said. I, I wasn't speaking. It's Luigi. We're looking for Luigi Russo. He was just okay. speaking. Yeah, hi, hi, Eric. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I believe I, I defer to the client. In, in all fairness, I, I believe that they're interested in certainly creating a green building. I have not been fully informed as to the actual certification, whether it's silver, gold, or platinum. Okay, but are are you working on the various elements that would? Um, yes, we are. The certification levels. Yes, we are. Okay, and and what are the ways in which this building can make most progress? Well, again, it's basically the local. Uh, uh, there, there are many aspects of the actual certification, which are very simple to, to obtain. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is whether we go to silver, platinum, or gold, I'm sorry, silver, gold, or platinum, 
there are many, many other items that we would have to uh, uh, review. And, and obviously uh, the cost is uh, certainly uh, uh, something that has to be looked at to achieve those three goals. Okay, well, I'd encourage you and your client to reach as far as you possibly can. Thank you. Uh, we shall. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the commission for this team? Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, next, the next speaker appears to be, is, is Fasia Class uh, going to testify? She's a, a staff member of the uh, council, council member that previously spoke. She signed up next. I believe that she was just signed up in case the councilwoman was unable to join. So okay. Okay. I don't see her in the room. And, okay. And the next speaker is Marisa Williams. Good morning, everyone. Well, actually, good afternoon now. Can everyone hear me? Please start. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon, Chair, Chair Lermont and members of the commission. My name is Marissa Williams, and I'm a representative of 32BJ SEIU here on behalf of the 85,000 32BJ members to express our strong support for this project. We are pleased to announce that the developer Trilon has reached out to make an early and credible commitment to provide prevailing wage jobs to the future building service workers at this site. These jobs are typically filled by local members of the community and because of this commitment, will pay family sustaining wages, which help bring working families into the middle class. These apartments are needed for working, for working people in for working people in Queens. This commitment to good prevailing wage jobs will give opportunity for upward mobility, security, and dignity to working class families. 32BJ supports developers who are responsible and best in the communities where they build. We know that this development will continue to uphold the industry standard and provide opportunities for working families to thrive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Ms. Williams? Commissioner Goodrich. All right, thank you so much for testifying. Um, and I'm glad that you did. We actually had a conversation yesterday about um, you know, one of the criticisms that uh, often with the projects, redevelopment like this is rezoning is um, the promise of jobs. And then when the project is done, the actual the reality and, and how it might not match. And I'm curious, since you're, um, you've are you testified, uh, you know, that you're in support of the project, what exact, is there a contract or is there anything specific that would show that there will actually be jobs that would benefit your members and specifically people who live in the community, just so that there's some measure of accountability. One, and I'll just end that by saying, one of the things that was mentioned yesterday is sometimes there is a contract just to ensure accountability with the union. So I'm wondering if that happened here. Yes, we um, always have a standard agreement that we go into with um, most developers that we discuss um, with to uh, make sure that there are prevailing wage shops once the buildings are set up. And that's something that we can have um, sent over to you to take a look at. That would be great. And, it, and, and my last question is, is it also, does it also designate that there for people in the community or is it just prevailing wage jobs, just, just prevailing wage jobs? I can only speak specifically to the building service wage jobs, as well as the, um, the agreement to the affordable um, housing that is open to the members of the community. Um, but outside of that, I can't speak to other jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any additional questions for Ms. Williams? Okay, well, thank you again, Ms. Williams, for your testimony. Um, is there anyone else present who would like to speak on this item?
there are no further speakers on this item in the room or indicating that they've signed up. Okay, then this hearing is closed. Thank you. Our next item, Commissioners, Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 14, CD2N220217BDM, a public hearing in a matter of an application for the establishment of the West Village Business Improvement District. Okay. Thank you. Um, I understand that we have an another uh, council member, uh, Eric Botcher, who will speak on this item before the team presents. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Just like my colleagues earlier, this is my first time uh, giving testimony as a council member. So thank you so much. Um, and this is an important application to me because I actually attended the very first meetings, the very first community meetings in Brooks Schooley's living room where the residents got together about putting a bid together. And I've been a supporter very early on because this has been a, a true grassroots effort coming from the community to create this new bid. Um, and as many local residents have said um, and will say today, this bid will benefit our community a lot by providing a lot of the services that bids provide sanitation ser services, supplemental homeless outreach services and more. And it's so important that we provide these services now as we come back from the COVID-19 crisis. My predecessor, uh, Speaker Corey Johnson contributed significant resources to augment the sanitation and beautification initiatives in this area covered by the bid and uh, we've worked a lot with small business owners and, and witnessed the efforts of uh, all the bids in our district. So I can really attest to the need for this kind of organized communication, coordination, and advocacy that a bid can provide. I also want to support the applicants in um, uh, asking for a $100 assessment for residential tax lots. I know that our residents are exceptionally engaged in their community and allowing them to participate credibly in a bid in the bid governance will be critical to the bids success going forward. So it's for these reasons that I support the formation of the West Village Business Improvement District and I urge you to uh, vote in favor of it. And I really wanna thank all the community members who've come together. I can't think of another bid application that came from residents uh, working with local small businesses in this way. It's been a truly inspiring effort and I'm really excited to see it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, council member and, and well, Welcome, and I, I'm hopeful that that won't be the last time we see you here. Um, now we'll turn to questions from the commission. Uh, Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, is the council member still with us? I'm here. Uh, thank you for your testimony and, and uh, welcome to city government. I um, just wanted to ask you from your vantage point, what do you think are uh, the immediate most immediate priorities of, of this bid should it be established? So Lower 7th Avenue um, has been for a long time, a stretch of our district that sees a lot of wear and tear. It is a residential and commercial district, but it has millions of visitors every year that come through. So sanitation is a huge problem and you know, there's bigger issues at play here for why the city alone can't adequately keep the neighborhood clean, can't keep the waste baskets from overflowing. But there's an immediate need for augmented sanitation services. We also have in this part of town, we have 
a big um, issue with unhoused New Yorkers uh, who are in need of services. And again, we run into the question of, you know, why are privately funded services needed? Shouldn't the city be taking care of all this? But we have an immediate need for supplemental services and I look forward to working on uh, that with the bid. So these are just two of the issues that the bid's gonna be working on in addition to providing uh, support for many of the small businesses. I don't need to tell you that the small shops of the village have been struggling mightily the last few years as property taxes have gone up, rents have gone up, uh, the changing nature of retail. So having this bid that will be able to provide support and coordination among the small businesses in this area will also be very important. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions for the council member? Okay. So thank you so much for your testimony. Thank uh, we you. We will now move uh, to, yes, good luck. Uh, we'll now move to uh, M. Blaze Backer from um, the Small Business Services Department of the City. Place there. Hi, yes, just on. Can right. you hear me? Hi. Okay, great. Hi again. Uh, good afternoon, good. Chair Laramont Commissioners. Um, Michael Hi. Backer, Deputy Commissioner of Neighborhood Development, Department of Small Business Services, and I'm here to testify in support of the establishment of the West Village Business Improvement District in Manhattan. At SBS, we are working hard to open doors for New Yorkers across the five boroughs, focusing on creating stronger businesses, connecting New Yorkers to good jobs, and fostering thriving neighborhoods. Throughout the pandemic and now into recovery, SBS has been a key provider of programs, services, and critical information to small businesses and commercial corridors alike. We provide guidance to bids to help businesses comply with key to NYC requirements, as well as information on how businesses can ensure safe reopening for employees and customers alike. In addition, we have coordinated hundreds of hours of interagency response through regular program calls and partnerships with DOT on open streets and the Office of Recovery on commercial district safety and cleanliness. We believe bids are central to these efforts as valuable and proven partners in fostering the vitality of the city's neighborhoods and commercial districts. In addition to our role overseeing and supporting the city's existing network of 76 bids, SBS also supervises the bid formation and expansion process, serving as an advisor and resource for communities interested in planning or expanding bids. We are careful to ensure that each steering committee we work with adheres to our planning process and policies, solicits robust community input, and performs extensive outreach to demonstrate broad-based support across all stakeholder groups. Bid formation is a very time and resource intensive process and a successful bid formation effort requires substantial commitment from all stakeholders involved. In 2017, the steering committee for the proposed West Village bid was formed following several years of self-funded supplemental services along 7th Avenue. The steering committee represented residential as well as commercial property owners and stakeholders in the proposed district. After an extensive outreach effort by the steering committee, SBS determined that the documented support among all stakeholder groups was sufficient to bring this proposal before the commission. Specifically, 28% of owners of commercial property representing 50% of the district's commercial assessed value documented the support of the bid. 17% of district commercial tenants responded with 100% affirming support of bid formation. In addition, the residential property owner response is also overwhelmingly positive with only 1% unsupportive of the proposal. The proposed West Village bid, which would be the 26th bid in Manhattan, has met SPS's prerequisites for bid formation. Bids are necessary champions for their districts that deliver essential services, improve business conditions, and enhance quality of life in their neighborhoods. At this challenging moment in the city's history, bids are playing a central role in communicating to their small business members and providing them with access to public and private resources to help them adapt to changing business conditions and recover from the pandemic. Therefore, SBS supports the establishment of the West Village bid to ensure the continued vibrancy of this important and unique neighborhood. I'd like to acknowledge that the bid formation effort is also represented here today by the West Village Steering Committee Chair, Ms. Schooley, and members of the Formation Steering Committee who will also be providing testimony and answering any questions. At this time, I'm happy to take any questions you might have for me. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the commission? Okay. Commissioner Levin. Um, yeah, just while we, <clears throat> while we have um, Mr. Backer with us, um, I noticed that one of the unusual features of this bid is that the driving forces come from residents um, and that the um, fees to be charged to the residential properties are somewhat different than we usually see in a bid. Um, and I imagine we're going to hear more about that when we get to talking to the folks who've been behind this effort. But I'm wondering if there's anything you'd like to tell us about um, issues that you may have had to, that SBS has had to grapple with in um, allowing the cost of this to fall uh, to a greater extent on the residential properties than you usually do. And in particular, the notion that the tax lots, um, you know, a condominium is an individual tax lot. So in some cases, we're going to have entire rental buildings, presumably, if they're entirely residential, they would just pay a $100 fee. <clears throat> Whereas you could have a building that's all condominium units, and the, you know, and each unit holder would then have to pay the $100 fee. Is that an issue that you had to work your way through? So uh, taking that latter part first, I mean, I, you're very right about that. And it is something we <clears throat> talked about how to address and, and we gave some advice on the matter, I think. And it, this is sort of an ongoing challenge with a lot of bids assessment formulas, not just this one. Um, there are, you know, I, I don't have the number in front of me, but, you know, a, a good 20 uh, to 25 bids in the city do have some form of residential assessment. So that it's just really in the last kind of you know, 12, uh, 15 years where that hasn't mm -hmm. been quite as common. So, but that, that is a reality that co-ops and rental buildings, right, get treated as the single tax lot and it does create some distortion um, in sort of how the assessment works. In this case, my understanding is that, again, not only do, not only the residents still only paying 10% of the overall assessment, so the 90% is still falling on, on commercial properties, but also that the predominant um, residential building was sort of the thing either some condos and also like single tax lot brownstones. And so while the point you raise is a valid one, I think it wasn't enough of an issue for the typology of buildings in the in the district to really overcomplicate the formula. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, look, I didn't mean to raise it as an objection just to understand how it works because it is does seem to be atypical here. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, are there any additional questions from the commission? So thank you, Mr. Backer. Thank you. The next uh, speaker will be Katherine Donaldson. Okay. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, I've president, been president of the Bedford Barrel Commerce Block Association for many years. Uh, we do an annual membership, and our neighborhood is really interested in beautification and community outreach. I think that having the <clears throat> assessment will not be a problem here, particularly if the bid will take care of <clears throat> timely graffiti removal and cleaning our streets. And that would be a wonderful thing to happen, happen here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Donaldson. Are there any questions for Ms. Donaldson? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much for testifying. The next speaker will be Brooke Schooley. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. I can't see how to turn my video on. Oh, here we go.
Hi, I'm Brooke Schooley, a West Village property owner and chair of the West Village Bid Steering Committee. In 2014, I founded the 7th Avenue South Alliance. It was a or is a largely uh, resident funded and resident led nonprofit that provided clean and green services to the 7th Avenue South and Bleecker area through 2020. In 2000, 2018, our board identified a bid as a more sustainable way to provide supplemental services to the community and formed the West Village Bid Steering Committee. The committee is comprised of 22 residents, property owners, and business owners with each group having roughly equal representation on the, on the committee. And we've spent much time over the last three plus years planning and garnering support for a bid. This is a very mixed use neighborhood with primarily ground floor commercial space. We have almost no office space. So this is um, truly mixed use. We have a heavy concentration of restaurants and bars. And as Eric mentioned, we are a popular destination neighborhood for non-village residents and for tourists to the city. As a result, we have sanitation needs that exceed the services uh, provided by the city. Accordingly, the majority of the uh, just under $600,000 bid budget will go to clean and green activities. In addition to acting as an advocate for city agencies uh, or with city agencies, our activities will include daily trash can emptying, sidewalk and curb sweeping, graffiti and stick sticker removal, sidewalk power washing, pest control, uh, tree pit plantings and maintenance, uh, and uh, as Eric also mentioned, supplemental uh, homeless outreach. The median commercial or mixed use property owner will pay about $1,280 per year. Uh, the residential tax law owners, as uh, was just discussed, will pay a flat $100 per year, which will cover just about 10% of the bids budget. We felt it really important that residents contribute. This bid is going to be clean and green focused and given the neighborhood uh, profile, residents uh, benefit a lot from those services. We're truly a mixed use district. A third of our uh, square footage is residential and the majority of it is located above ground floor retail. Uh, so we truly share our sidewalks. Further, over 80% of the residential tax lots are townhomes or condos. Uh, which I think also Blaze alluded to, um, where we have owner occupants uh, who will enjoy the quality of life benefits of a bid. Additionally, we have a very vocal and activist resident community uh, and uh, the steering committee felt that having meaningful representation on the board by residents was critical to our outreach. Uh, and we wanted that representation, representation to be credible with residents having skin in the game. And as you see from the CB2 resolution, they agreed uh, and recommended uh, residential board representation exceeding that required by law. We've completed significant community outreach, uh, have uh, garnered a lot of support. Uh, no significant uh, opposition has emerged. We have the support of five block associations as well as our elected officials and CB2. I hope that you will allow us to move forward with this important work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Cooley. Are there are there any questions from the commission? Okay. Again, thank you for your testimony and, and work on this effort. Um, thank you. The next speaker is, is Stephen Werther. Good morning. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Yes. 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 Great. So I'm Stephen Werther. I own a restaurant for the last six years on Bleecker Street in the West Village called Suprema. And I also am a resident on Bleecker Street above the restaurant. And so I bring both perspectives as to why uh, a bid would benefit uh, the neighborhood. And as had been previously stated, it is a high traffic neighborhood, even though it's very residential, we get a lot of tourists, a lot of uh, uh, visitors, uh, local, foreign, uh, who bring tremendous business to the neighborhood, but also leave an impact on the neighborhood. And so uh, the long awaited bid for the West Village would uh, greatly benefit the neighborhood in a number of ways that have been already said, uh, sanitation and pest control. We all know that the, uh, the neighborhood suffers from a sanitation issue uh, with outdoor dining now, and I have a restaurant, 
the uh, sanitation uh, issue has um, uh, become worse. Uh, the pest control has become more challenging and no one wants to live in a neighborhood full of garbage and rats. Uh, the graffiti is a problem. It's an eyesore uh, and uh, it's very difficult to uh, combat. Uh, the beautification uh, uh, possibilities are endless for the neighborhood, many of them being very simple. And uh, you know, we, we look forward to the neighborhood being more beautiful and up to its potential. Having a communication hub through the bid uh, where we can uh, get some direction and some advocacy with city agencies would be enormously helpful. And it's been very challenging over the last uh, couple of COVID years dealing with the constantly changing landscape for, uh, for businesses uh, primarily and, and restaurants specifically. Uh, and there's a security issue in the neighborhood. You know, the neighborhood can become um, dangerous and, and uh, unnecessarily so. Uh, I have uh, one child that still lives at home with me and quite frankly, I do. Uh, worry about her, even though she's 20 years old when she comes home late, uh, that the neighborhood isn't as safe as it could be and isn't as safe as it should be. So for all these reasons and many more, I fully support as a resident and as a business owner, uh, the formation of the West Village bid. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Werther. Are there any questions from the commission? So thank you very much for your time. Um, the next speaker is William Abramson. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so thank you City Planning Commission for hearing my testimony. I have provided written testimony to Brooke so she could submit that as well. Um, a special shout out to uh, Vice Chair Knuckles. It's been a while and also uh, Commissioners Edie and Cirillo. Hope everyone's well and hope everyone had a uh, good New Year's. Um, my name is William Abramson, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm Director of Sales and Leasing at Buckbinder and Warren. Um, I represent the property owner that's been around New York City for 60 years, um, two generations, and I represent them in their retail and residential properties within this bid district and frankly, within the city. Um, I am not new to the world of bids. When I lived up in the Bronx, I chaired community board number eight. And we were part of formation of, I don't know the name of it, but it was the bid on 231st and Broadway. I've been on this steering committee with Brooke for two to three years. I sit on the Madison Avenue bid. I sit on the Flatiron bid. I am treasurer of the Village Alliance, also known as the A Street bid. And I co-chair the Union Square Partnership, which was the first bid ever created out of the 76 or so bids in all five boroughs. Um, given my long involvement with bids, I totally understand uh, how they enhance areas. And I think it's been e even more obvious during these COVID times um, where you could tell the difference between properties sitting within a bid district and properties outside. Uh, Councilman Bacherno happy to call them councilmen now, uh, and Brooke and Steve, they've all discussed this already. The, the core services of any bid is cleanliness and, and safety. And those are two of the primary goals uh, needed for this bid, particularly for this district as already addressed. I also think a critical thing that uh, Councilman Botcher also spoke about was that bids act as a conduit with city agencies for small businesses to deal with SBS or policing, or other city agencies, the bid just acts as an invaluable tool for, uh, for, for communications with those agencies. Um, Brooke has done an amazing job chairing this formation. As I said, I've been involved with bids for a long time, including formations, and she's just been outstanding jobs, been driven by the community. And uh, we are wholeheartedly, Buck Finder the property owner, is wholeheartedly endorsing and looking forward to this formation of this bid. Thank you very much and happy to take any questions. Thank you. 
Are there questions from the commission? <laughs> okay. So thank you very much, um, um, Mr. Abramson. My pleasure. The next speaker is David Gruber. Um, thank you. Uh, I am David Gruber. I'm the former chair and present member of CB2. I'm uh, also president of the West Village Landmark Association and, other, and, other, and others. Uh, I'm testifying today, however, as president of the Carmine Street Block Association. I am strongly uh, in favor of this bid. Uh, while the population is largely residential, we do attract some 3 million visitors a year to the area and are overwhelmed by the garbage, waste, public safety issues, quality of life issues, irrational traffic regulations uh, that the flow of these many people brings to this historic district. We have for years through the 7th Avenue Alliance and Brooks Schooley paid to have the area clean. This is in addition to the municipal services, municipal services, uh, as Eric has said, uh, can't do the job by themselves. We have the most liquor licenses per capita in the entire state, and by extension, more cafe table permits than any other community board. And this has been dramatically increased by the outdoor curbside restaurant shed program, and consequently, the rodents that that brings, which have now proliferated the village. The community needs help, and the, the bid will do it, both with garbage, sanitation, public safety, traffic flow, and all the other services Brooke mentioned to you. Um, you know, the bid model of the downtown style commercial area has changed over the years and residential development, development especially in retail Manhattan has grown like wisteria uh, in and around commercial core areas. The residential ta tax lot fee, which has been brought up will cost about $8.50 a month for condo people, $8.50 a month. Uh, and we residents can't wait to have this up and running as soon as possible. Uh, CB2 has voted almost unanimously, one dissenting vote in favor of this bid. And I thank you and hope uh, that this approval by the City Planning Commission is smooth and forthcoming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Gruber? Well, thank you very much for your testimony. The next speaker is Marla Wolf. Ms. Wolf, you should be able yes. to speak. Yes, uh, I was just trying to get my video working, okay. uh, but it doesn't seem to want to. That's okay. Uh, I am the West Village property owner and I enthusiastically support, oh, here we go. And I enthusiastically support the bid and the $100 resident fee. Um, I know there's been some concern over the proposed 100 yearly fee for residents, but it amounts to less than $10 a month. And I think that's an entirely reasonable amount for residential property owners to pay. When I first moved to the uh, West Village, the litter problem was a noticeable issue. And I was really pleased with the success of the 7th Avenue South Alliance. But when they had to stop their services, uh, I really noticed a difference, uh, especially with our littered sidewalks and our overflowing trash cans. And in addition, over the last couple of years, our neighborhood has experienced exponential graffiti applications, empty storefronts that really need help beyond what the city can offer. And in my mind, there's no question a bid would help us with these issues. The commercial businesses in our area, uh, they're more than just a place to eat and drink for us. They're our neighbors. And not only do we depend on their services, but we're vested in their success and their contribution to our beautiful neighborhood. I have spoken with all the residents in my small building and everyone is very supportive of the bid and the $100 resident fee. The bottom line is I have no problem paying that 
um, amount to assist our commercial neighbors in keeping our mutual neighborhood, to quote the, the bid tagline, clean, green, and safe. And this partnership, uh, the bid, this partnership between residents and commercial owners is one that I support wholeheartedly and, and hope you will too. Thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Wolf? If not, thank you very much for your testimony. The next speaker is Nicole Barth. Nicole Barth does not appear to be in the room. Okay. So then, is there anyone else present who would like to speak on this item? There are no further speakers on this item in the, in the Zoom. Thank you. Then this hearing is closed. Our next item, Commissioners, Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 15, CD1 N220153 PXM, a public hearing in the matter of a notice of intent to acquire office space concerning the NYPD office space 27 Cliff Street. Um, I understand that the first speaker will be uh, Chris Arte, the, the council member representing this district. Hi, uh, thank you all and thank you for hosting this Hello. meeting and allowing me to speak. Um, I'm here to echo and affirm the position of Community Board One who supports the application with the following conditions. First, I wanna make sure that residents of 80 John Street continue to have full access to the rest of the parking lot and the ADA accessible entrance to their building. Second, I want to confirm that no overflow or placard parking of World Trade Center Command, NYPD, or personnel vehicles will occur in the area because of this relocation. The applicant has communicated to the community board that any overflow vehicles will only occur at at the first precinct, and it will be helpful to reiterate that point today. Uh, parking placard use and illegal parking is already an issue in the district, so specifically in this area. And I ask that the applicant detail today how all associated vehicles will be kept off the street. Ticketing and other enforcement against illegal parking must be enforced, and sirens and any other disruption in the area must be minimized for all tenants around this building. I look forward to hearing how the issues I've mentioned will be addressed in this applicant presentation. Thank you again for hosting and allowing me to speak first. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, are there any questions from the commission for the council member? Okay. All right. Again, thank you for, for appearing before us today. Um, we will now have a three minute team presentation. Uh, we're getting the, the speakers in the room here. Okay, when I believe we've got the speakers all able to Mr. 
uh, Adriano, Mr. Grove, or? Hi, this is Lieutenant Adriano with NYPD. Are you able to unmute Captain Daniel McGee? He's yes. Here. Can you guys hear us? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Right, awesome. So, so first, I want to thank the commission for uh, hearing our submission today. Uh, my name is Captain Daniel McGee. I'm the commanding officer of the NYPD's World Trade Center Command. Uh, with me today is also um, my Lieutenant Riyasad Ali, who's my operations coordinator for the World Trade Center Command. I'd like to give you just a real quick background. We took over this command, or we took over, uh, the Trade Center was, was created, the command was created in 2011 on the 10th anniversary of September 11th. Uh, we were housed in a temporary facility at the time, which was the old uh, mounted unit located at 19 Barrett Street. Um, that was supposed to be a temporary location at the time. We had uh, about 250 officers that were assigned to the unit. As the um, as we we built out the command, uh, we realized that you know the space is entirely too small for for what it is that we need. Uh, what I'll say is that the um, uh, so what we do here is we, we cover the World Trade Center Command in conjunction with the Port Authority. So it's a 16 acre site here at the World Trade Center. Uh, really the key issue for us is uh, proximity to the World Trade Center site. Currently 19 Barrack Street is about 1.5 miles from the World Trade Center site. Uh, 27 Cliff Street where, where we're looking to uh, move to is about a half of a mile from the location. Um, as we as we've evolved as a threat landscape, he's about we, we're a counterterrorism unit. We're not we're not part of patrol. So uh, I mean, the good news is for, for 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 using the usage of Cliff Street is one is you know there's no prisoners that would be uh, you know uh, sent or taken down to to 27 Cliff Street. The other thing is that uh, we don't really have a um, uh, like the public doesn't really come into the to the building. Uh, you know, to, to, for services, okay? It's primarily just a counterterrorism unit and not a patrol command. Um, Captain, Captain McGee, um, yes. do you want to go through the slides a little bit? Sure, sure. Uh, so we went through the history, okay? Like I said, we're, that's uh, the history part. That's the next page, next slide. Okay, like I said, we were established in 2000, 2011. Uh, with an MOU with the Port Authority. We're housed at 19 Barrack Street, which is attached to the first precinct. Uh, it's where the old horse stables were. Uh, at the time, we had 250 officers assigned to the unit. And like I said, it was supposed to be a temporary location. Uh, the next slide. Okay, the, the, our mission basically is pretty simple. Where we, we, we cover the World Trade Center Command. We, we, uh, we secure the 16-acre site, which encompasses one World Trade, uh, three, four World Trade, the 9-11 Museum, and then it is going to be a, uh, a performing art center that will be built up out in um, 2023, and the St. Nicholas Creek Church, which is going to be built out in, uh, in 2022. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So uh, your, time, your time has expired. Your time has expired. I'm sorry. You have three minutes. Um, I will go to questions from the commission at this point. Um, thank you, Commissioner Dweck. Uh, thank you. Uh, Captain, can you speak to the concerns of the uh, council member that spoke earlier? Sure. So, so right now, the way we have, so right now, as we're uh, uh, sharing space with the first precinct, we have parking on Barrack Street. Um, we don't have a lot of vehicles as a command because we're centrally located. Uh, our officers are all assigned to the World Trade Center site. So there is no need to have a lot of vehicles for our, uh, for our command to operate. So as far as um, department vehicles, we, we, have, we have a limited number, 19. I have, I have another location where I'm currently at right now, which is at Washington Street. Uh, I have parking here at Washington Street. And I also, we, we, we do put cars, uh, vehicles on the site itself. So the need to have uh, like a, a, a lot of space for, for department vehicles 
is is uh, there, there really isn't a great need for it. As far as personal vehicles, which I think what the council member was a little bit more concerned about. So a lot of my offices are from uh, Long Island and they're from upstate New York. Um, other than my supervisors, most of my cops take mass transit. So they take either Long Island Railroad or they take Metro North. We don't allow parking of our, for our offices on Barrack Street, only, this, only supervisors and at any given tour. So just any given tour, I may have four to five supervisors working on that tour. So uh, as far as parking is concerned for them, it's, it, it won't be an issue. And the officers themselves, uh, you know, we have a, uh, an integrity control officer who goes around uh, around that area, make sure that there's no parking placard abuses with our officers. Um, most of my officers have been here for a, a long time, five to 10 years. Uh, they're kind of used to, uh, you know, this, the, the parking situation in the city, particularly over on Barrack Street. So, so a lot of them do take mass transit. As far as um, John Street, 80 John Street, where, where the council member mentioned about the residents having access to the, uh, to the parking garage. I think for, for me as a commanding officer, um, the one thing you wanna have, you wanna be a good neighbor. And I completely understand the, uh, the, the concerns of the, of the residents over there. So, you know, we're going to make sure that that we're going to live up to our end of the bargain of being good neighbors. We're not going to abuse. We're going to take up more spots than we're allotted. And we're going to have somebody available at that location at 27 Cliff Street, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'd be happy to provide a number to, to the residents there. So if there is an issue with parking, they can make a phone call and, and, and we, we can uh, we can handle whatever issue that that comes up. But as far as any issues that do come up, I'm, I'm really, I gotta be honest with you, we, we do a pretty good, really good job over at, at Barrack Street, uh, sharing space with the first precinct. And um, we don't get, we don't get a lot of, uh, we don't get any um, uh, parking complaints from, from, from the community down over there. Thank you. Are you gonna continue to keep the uh, parking at Washington Street that you mentioned? You yes. Are. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you. Uh, Captain, what is the uh, proposed length of the lease that you plan to in, uh, engage here? So I'll, I'll, I'll defer that to, to DCAS. Hi, this is Jason Ortiz with DCAS. The lease term is 20 years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any, any other questions from the commission for this team? Not, thank you very much uh, team for that presentation. Is there anyone else present who would like to speak on this item? There are no further speakers in the Zoom on this. Okay, thank you. Then this hearing is closed. Thank you. Our next item, commissioners, Borough of Manhattan, calendar numbers 16 and 17. CD6, calendar number 16. C220131 PSM, calendar number 17. N220132 HAM. A public hearing in a matter of applications for site selection, UDAP designation, project approval, and disposition of city owned property concerning the new Providence redevelopment, 225 East 45th Street. Uh, Commissioner Sprillo asked that I note that he is recused on this item. Okay, thank you. This will be a 10 minute team presentation. You can please begin. Um, hi, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present a new Providence uh, redevelopment project located at the 225 East 45th Street. Uh, my name is Zhong Huang, a borough planner with HPD Manhattan Planning Division. I'm joined today by my HPD colleague, our sister agency, uh, DHS, and the uh, Department of Social Service, and their development partners. 
uh, project renewal and the layer design and the consulting teams. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a content we will go through today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the site is currently owned by uh, DHS and HPD is advancing this project in partnership with DHS and the partner uh, project renewal. Uh, the proposed development will be a new 21 story building providing approximately 171 shelter beds and uh, approximately uh, 130, uh, 130 supportive available housing unit with on-site social service and a ground floor and medical clinic. Uh, just want to mention that here, the supportive available uh, units, a uh, portion of units are permanent housing, not transitional housing. Uh, the land use action to facilitate the proposed development include the disposition of a city on land and the site selection. Next slide, please. Uh, the site currently including uh, two existing buildings is located on the East uh, 45th Street between the third and the second avenues. Uh, next slide, please. So now I will turn the presentation over to our development team, Eric from uh, Project Renewal to introduce themselves and walk through the detail of the project. Hi, I'm Eric Rosenbaum. I'm the CEO of Project Renewal. Um, our mission is to end the cycle of homelessness by empowering individuals and families to renew their lives with health, homes, and jobs. <clears throat> we were established in 1967. Today, we employ about 1,000 people and house 2,000 individuals and families in 16 shelter and housing sites. And <clears throat> for eight of those, we were the developer and are the owner and operator. In total, we manage 39 programs that serve more than 13,000 New Yorkers annually. <clears throat> Um, we complement our housing with supportive services that are tailored to the needs of our homeless and at-risk clients, including licensed on-site and mobile medical health care and workforce development programming. The new Providence building that's the subject of this application is a former convent plus an adjoining townhouse that's currently owned by uh, NYCDHS. We've operated the site since the 1990s as a shelter for 130 homeless women. The clients are all diagnosed with mental health or substance use disorders. We provide comprehensive services on site, including a licensed Article 28 clinic. The existing layout is very inefficient. So for example, the floor plates between the two buildings don't align. And while the clinic is theoretically open to the community, clients would have to go through the shelter to get there, which makes it impractical. <clears throat> the building is uh, dramatically underbuilt per the zoning. And so redevelopment would increase the quality of life for client staff in the neighborhood. Uh, next slide, please. So the redevelopment um, will provide an opportunity to modernize the shelter and maximize the buildable FAR to add permanent housing to the site in addition to shelter. <clears throat> the program that's proposed will include a new purpose-built shelter with 171 beds that will serve the same population that's in the shelter today, which is single women with mental health diagnoses. We will be adding 130 new supportive and affordable housing apartments. 79 of those are for formerly homeless tenants paying 30% of their income and come with on-site supportive services. <clears throat> the other 51 will be affordable for New Yorkers earning up to 60% of AMI. Um, <clears throat> this slide gives you kind of the, the breakdown. The ground floor will include a new Article 28 medical clinic that'll serve residents and the broader community uh, regardless of ability to pay. Um, Project Renewal and our program staff has been closely involved in the design of the building um, and the project uh, as proposed is a win for everybody in the community. It's really rare we get a chance to have such direct input into shelter design and we're really enthusiastic about this project. Thank you. Okay, uh, next slide please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Keith Engel from Datton Architects. And with that, I'll walk you through some of the key items for this um, exciting development. Starting with this slide, which is the plan of the ground floor of the project, which is comprised of uh, the three major programs, the shelter, which is in blue, supportive housing in red, and the clinic in yellow. So these three programs have individual entries directly from 45th Street, the shelter to the west, the supportive housing to the east, and the clinic at the center of the building. Uh, the public facing clinic occupies a, a significant portion of the plan, as you can see, um, as well as the street wall, and will impart some activity onto the street level experience. In terms, of, in terms of the general zoning of the overall 21 story building, the shelter spans from the second through the, through the sixth floor 
and the supportive housing will span from the 7th through the 22nd floor. Next slide, please. This next slide describes the second floor of the building, which comprises the more um, communal shelter programs that are required for shelter residents. A dining room is located along the front facade, which maximizes daylight and views. A commercial kitchen is located at the center of the plan. And a, and a, key, a key programmatic element and exterior roof terrace is provided at the, at the rear of the building for passive recreation for both the shelter and the supportive housing residents. Uh, next slide, please. This next slide describes both the 21-story massing and the street-level experience of the building. The image on the left illustrates the view along 45th Street looking east. I would note the contextual relationship of our proposed building to its context, in particular to the 16-story A&E building to the east and the 33-story Wyndham Hotel to the west. The image on the right describes the relationship of the project to the street-level experience, where we considered how ground floor pro program can inform this experience as well. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of additional design features, the project will incorporate sustainable measures and provide a healthy living environment for residents. The project will also meet enterprise green community standards. Um, and a highlight of the features provided will include items such as low flow plumbing fixtures, ample daylight opportunities throughout, healthy low VOC materials, and a high performance building envelope. Um, the roof terrace, which I spoke to previously, will incorporate green elements, but also providing passive recreation. Uh, next slide, please. And this concludes our presentation and we're happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you very much. Um, are there questions from the commission? Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you. Um, I had asked a question yesterday during review session. I don't know if you were uh, present or not. Uh, as it relates to the supportive units, uh, those units would be uh, transitional as opposed to permanent. And if so, what would be the length of, length of stay of the, um, of the uh, uh, individuals uh, in those units and uh, what happens thereafter? Uh, how do you, how would they transition out and, and what, is the, uh, what is the extent of the efforts to, to find them housing elsewhere? Uh, 130 apartments um, are uh, for tenants that have rent stabilized leases. They're, they're not transitional. Oh, okay. I, I thought I heard something else uh, that, that 79 or something uh, were, um, were uh, transitional. No, the, the, the tenants there will, <clears throat> will have uh, full rent stabilized leases. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? So thank you very much I, to the team for the presentation. Um, oh, sorry, I don't see you. Sorry. Okay. Please. I might have um, completely missed this, but this is no one. It, so this my 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 question, and I'm going to be like Rain Man for all of these. Is is anyone being displaced? Right? Is anyone, you know, does this in does this project involve anyone who is already there having to move elsewhere, forced or not? The the existing uh, shelter clients, um, I think the DHS can speak to this, but. <clears throat> they will either be moved to permanent housing before we start the project, or um, if there are any that are, uh, that are remaining at that time, uh, they'll be moved to another shelter. But I think the plan is to drop the census so that, so that there isn't any displacement. Leilani, that, do you? That is correct. I'm sorry, I was trying to unmute. That, that is correct. So the individuals who are currently residing at this location, DHS will try to uh, connect those individuals to another shelter facility, uh, but the ultimate goal would be to transition those individuals into permanent housing. So those who are housing ready, uh, we would you know, move those individuals into permanent housing and those who are not housing ready 
we'll try to connect them to another shelter facility that's close to their support networks. Um, and upon return, we're hoping that the individuals uh, that will be returning back would have, ha would have secured permanent housing by the time it's time for them to return back once this project is completed. Thank you. And I saw the chart and I was trying to write this down, but then it switched to the next slide. So how many of the full, or rather what percentage of the full units will be considered affordable housing? I know we established that there'll be permanent rent stabilized leases. Um, so I, 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 so this, is, this is, I yeah, heard 70% and I don't know if that uh, was. So this is, this is, this is Paul Woody. I'm the vice president of real estate for Project Renewal. So 100% of the units, uh, the apartment okay. units will be affordable. Um, and there's an overlay on 60% of the units uh, that are, that are, that makes them considered supportive housing. Supportive housing. Okay. And my last question is, and I guess I just want to clarify this for myself, for the apartments that are or will be considered rent stabilized leases, they were already rent stabilized and then will they start at the same rent that whatever the existing tenant had before or will these be considered, I don't know. I don't know how, I'm just curious because I think some landlords like improvements or, and I know well, that I, it's I, obviously a shelter but I'm curious or part of it for formerly homeless but I'm just curious about the, rent state like the actual amount, if it will jump from the same amount that it was before, or it'll be considered well, some type of improve. I mean, I don't know. Hi, good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, I think there's a little bit of confusion here. The existing building is just a shelter. There are no affordable units. So as I, I think I believe, as the team has mentioned, the project incorporates new a new shelter with more beds. In, in, in addition to that, we, we are building affordable housing. 130 units, uh, a percent, 60 percent of those 130 units will be supportive housing units, and the remaining 40 percent will be, you know, regular affordable units uh, set aside with a different ranges of MIs. Those rents will follow the HPD rents and guidelines and will be said according to the proposed MIs. So just to clarify, as we currently, we don't have rental units in the shelter. I don't, uh, uh, I just wanna clarify that the rents will be said according to the MIs, existing MIs. So there, there, won't, there won't be that change that you're mentioning commissioner, uh, as you've seen in, in other buildings, because basically the rents will start from, you know, new units, basically, not existing units. I, I'm right. not sure and if I that clarifies. I want to follow up on a question that Vice Chair Knuckles asked to clarify. So there will be transient housing or there will be, because I think what I, at least what I heard the answer to, the question, to that question was, no, these are permanent affordable housing rent stabilized leases. So that's why I asked my question. Yeah, I think the confusion- oh, think That's not, that's not, or is it that there's two separate? So explain that for me because- Yeah, yeah. I, I, I believe that the confusion is that because um, during the review session, I believe there was an answer that these were, or a percentage of the units were transitional housing. Uh, just to clarify, there are no transition housing. All of the units, all the affordable units will be <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a little bit coming out of a call. Um, all units will be uh, will have a, a, a oh yeah, I missed the word. Will be affordable units with a, a affordability period. So no transitional housing. All units will be affordable. Again, sixty percent of those units will be supportive housing. And the, remo the remaining 40% will be a regular affordable units. Uh, but just to be clear, um, uh, there are no transition in housing here. And the shelter, the shelter beds will continue being shelter beds, and, and that's it. Um, okay, now I remember. So all the affordable units will be subject to a regulatory agreement for a specific period of time. I cannot recall what will be that uh, regulatory period, but 
that that's what will uh, convert them as uh, affordable units. So there's housing for, for formerly homeless and current homeless. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I think one, maybe something that's getting at the heart of the confusion is that this building contains two sort of distinct programs. One is a, is a homeless shelter, right, with 170 beds. Um, and that's a shelter, so that's not housing and, and, and ten, clients won't have leases. And then separately, there'll be a separate entrance for a housing um, building, right, that starts on the seventh floor. Um, and it goes up to the top of the building, and that will have 130 units of affordable and supportive housing. Um, and those, and that portion of the building is financed through an HPD term sheet, um, supportive housing loan program. Uh, it'll be permanent housing, affordable and supportive units. Does that clarify it a little bit? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Paul. That was great. Thank you. Are there any additional questions from the commission? Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we will move on to speakers. The next speaker is Renzo Ramirez. Thank you, commissioners. Have a good day. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Oh, okay, cool. I don't know why my camera isn't working. Um, all right, doesn't matter. Don't worry. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chair Chair Lamont and members of the commission. Uh, my name is Renzo Ramirez, and I am a member of Thirty Two BJ SCIU. I'm here on behalf of the more than eighty five thousand Thirty Two BJ members to express our support for this project. The developers HPD, DHS, and Project Renewal have applied to dispose of and redevelop a city-owned site, which includes a shelter. We are pleased to announce that Project Renewal has reached out early to make a credible commitment to provide prevailing wage jobs to the future security workers at this site. 32BJ members support responsible developers who invest in the communities where they build, we know that this development will continue to uphold the industry standard and provide opportunities for working families to thrive. Project Renewal has reached out about making a commitment to the prevailing wage for security workers. We will continue to keep the community updated as we hold conversations with developers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Ramirez, are there any questions for Mr. Ramirez? Okay, thank you. The next speaker is Joelle Balam Schwan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Hi, my name is Joelle Balam Schwan. I'm the Engagement and Communications Manager at the Supportive Housing Network of New York, which is a statewide organization that advocates on behalf of supportive housing providers. And I speak today on behalf of the network to express our strong support of the new Providence redevelopment and ask that the City Planning Commission also be supportive. So for those of you who might be less familiar with supportive housing, it is deeply affordable housing with wraparound on-site social services like case management, occupational therapy, provides homes and stability for the most vulnerable in our society. The new Providence redevelopment will transform what is currently an aged city-owned shelter into a beautiful state-of-the-art building that will create 130 deeply affordable and supportive housing units and a health clinic serving low-income New Yorkers. At a time when the city faces dual housing and homelessness crises and is looking at the end of the eviction moratorium, it is more critical than ever before that we all work together to ensure that we create new homes and say yes to every opportunity to make a dent in the shelter census. Additionally, Project Renewal is a highly respected 
nonprofit. They have operated the shelter in this neighborhood for decades and have been responsible, have been a responsible neighbor and partner. And the network can think of no better provider to lead this development to create new housing opportunities that can help permanently end homelessness for New Yorkers in need. So thank you to the City Planning Commission for, for, for providing this opportunity for me to express the support for a new Providence project. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Baumschwan? Okay, seeing none, I say thank you again. And now I will ask whether or not there's anyone else present who would like to speak on this item. There are no sign further up. speakers in the Zoom or signed up. Okay. Then I, okay. So then I, this hearing is closed. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Burr, Brooklyn, calendar numbers 18 and 19. CD5, calendar number 18. C210031. ZMK. Calendar number 13, N210032, ZRK. A public meeting in the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning Sutter Avenue rezoning. And again, as a clarification, these are calendar numbers 12 and 13, 18 and 19, I'm sorry. Calendar numbers 18 and 19, commissioners. Sorry, this will be a 10 minute presentation, team presentation. Uh. Ms. Arantia, your camera and microphone are on. You should be able to begin if you're ready. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, I just want to uh, make a correction that this is going to be a three-minute presentation, and we have speakers available for questions. That's fine. Um, so good afternoon. Hey, My hey. name is Lisa Orantia, hey. Land Use Counsel from Ackerman LLP. Thank you for your time today. The proposed zoning and text amendments are will allow the construction of a new five-story mixed-use building with affordable housing units to replace non-conforming commercial uses on an underutilized lot. Next slide. The rezoning area is located at the eastern edge of a two-story residential neighborhood where the character changes to the east of the site uh, due to the Transit Authority Rail Yard, um, five 20-story Linden Towers buildings, and convenience stores near South Conduit Avenue. Uh, slide three, please. Uh, the development site is used for a non-conforming beauty salon, restaurant, auto repair, and dry cleaners. The buildings were constructed in the 1970s. And the remainder of the project area has two-story residential buildings and a non-conforming parking lot. Next slide. The proposed map change from R5 to R6A with a C24 overlay allows a modest increase in residential floor area, for the creation of affordable housing within a transit zone. Allowable building heights will be suitable in the context of the 20 story Linden Plaza buildings in the nearby and buildings in the nearby R6 and R6A districts that allow taller buildings. The overlay will strengthen the uh, developing retail corridor along Sutter Avenue and allow as of right commercial uses to replace non conforming commercial buildings, commercial uses in outmoded buildings. Uh, the existing residential buildings will be allowed to continue under the proposed actions. 
And the proposed text amendment would designate the area for mandatory inclusionary housing under options one and two. Next slide, please. The proposed development is a five-story mixed-use building with 28 units. The ground floor will have 7,400 square feet of retail space and seller parking will have uh, 10 parking spaces. And sustainable features will include um, a required solar or green roof, as well as double glazed windows and energy efficient appliances. Next slide, please. The proposed new housing where none currently exists will provide a mix of affordable units for a range of household incomes and would integrate formerly homeless units with low and moderate income households. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for uh, Ms. Arancia or the rest of this team? Commissioner Levin. Um, yes, thank you. I have a question about um, the borough president's recommendation, I think, which jibes with the observations of several of us on the commission about the afford proposed affordability levels, um, why it is the applicant is choosing to pursue option two when the area median income uh, would seem to be better matched by option one. Um, and then I have a question about the um, project area. Okay, sure. So option two allows us to achieve a mix that was agreed to with the council member, which is to make all residential units affordable with 80% of the units reserved for 60% AMI or lower and the remaining uh, units at 80% AMI. So currently a uh, majority of the units um, is reserved for households earning 50% AMI or lower. Uh, we have three units for formerly homeless, 20 units for households earning 50% AMI, and then five units for households earning 80% AMI. So the, in this case, the non-MIH units will be governed by a regulatory agreement with HPD um, under the Neighborhood Construction Program. Uh, and then our affordable housing consultant, John Butler, is joining us today, um, and he can explain some of the challenges with using option one for this particular project. Okay, so that's very helpful. So th this is a 100% affordable building. Correct. Just uh, with a portion of that under MIH and the rest under an array. I, I had missed the fact that there were no market rate units here. So that's, that's very helpful. Um, right. The borough president's other condition matches something that I had observed as well, and that is the potential vulnerability of the what we call the out parcels, the um, parcels adjoining uh, the development site that would be covered by the rezoning, and they are own they are occupied by um, I think it's two family residential units, and one of them in the environmental work is targeted as a projected development site, and of course displacement is the secondary displacement is something we always worry about here. Can, and the borough president's recommendation was that you take those out parcels um, out of the project area and that we only rezone the development site, which I think also has some, you know, its own land use problems um, associated with it. Can you tell us what you know about the um, residential buildings that will be included in the project area and their vulnerability to redevelopment? Sure, so there are three two family residential buildings on the Western side of the block front and those are included in the rezoning area. Those are expected to remain in place and they can continue under uh, the rezoning. But the planning goals that support the rezoning for the development site also apply to the remaining lots on this block front that is adding density to a transit oriented site. It's a 70 foot wide street, uh, supporting the use of underproductive land, underutilized land, and um, supporting the need for affordable housing. Um, the EAS did analyze the opposite corner lot, the corner opposite the development site 
together with that unlicensed parking lot in the back as a projected development site. Um, and it was conservative in doing so because uh, seeker general guidance is that those are, all of these lots are really too small or, or they are quite small. And so generally they're considered not likely to be developed. Um, but if they are redeveloped, the sites are appropriate for added density with affordable housing. Okay, thank you for a thorough answer. Are there any additional questions from the commission? Okay. Thank you, Lisa, nice to see you. Thank you, you too. Um, is there anyone, is there anyone else present that would like to speak on this item? There are no further speakers on this item in the Zoom or signed up. Okay, so then this hearing is closed. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, is there any, any other business uh, before the commission? Uh, no, Chair Lamont, but we do have um, some public information that we would like to share with our audience at this time. For those of you who were un unable to or did not wish to testify, you can submit written testimony online by selecting this hearing on the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal through DCP's web page or by mailing your comment to City Planning Commission, Calendar Information Office, 120 Broadway, 31st floor, New York, New York, 10271. Thank you. Is is there any other business? We do have a review session uh, to discuss right. one item. So I will open the, we'll close the hearing. The public meeting is closed. It's uh, 126 it's PM. And uh, we'll open the City Planning Commission uh, special review session for Wednesday, January 19th, uh, 2022. Uh, quorum is present and it is 1.26 p.m. We have one item on our agenda. The first item is a Manhattan non euler item, um, the uh, Penn Station GPP. Um, there was a letter circulated and the Manhattan office is available uh, if there are any questions or discussion. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? All right, then. Okay. So uh, are we going to ask for an assent by a show of hands with respect to this letter, which we would uh, send uh, to ESDC? Uh, subject to some non-substantive um, modifications that, you know, may need to be made. If there's anything substantive, of course, we would come back to the commission. So could we get that assent by a show of hands? All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Any opposed? Say nay. I don't have a... All right, I, very good. I'm new. Oh, okay, thanks. Pardon? I was just saying I don't have enough information. I don't even think I was here once. So, so. Okay, thank you. So you're you're not participating then. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, then, unless there's any further business, then no, the special no. review session is closed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care. Nice afternoon. Hey, bye bye. Mm -hmm. Thanks, bye-bye.